Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, David Stevenson. I'm a columnist for the Financial Times and Money Week in CityWire in the UK. Uh, I also do a lot of work in the uh, whole area of alternative proteins and future food with uh, the Future Food Finance website. Um, welcome to the uh, Agronomics Virtual Capital Markets afternoon. Um, it's, we're, we're, I think many more funds are trying to do these kind of formats where we open it up, not just to institutions, which would traditionally be a capital markets day, uh, but to a, a wider group of investors so that they could understand what's going on inside fund portfolios. Um, and to that aim, uh, we've got a wide selection of companies within the agronomics portfolio coming up. Each of them will have a kind of 15 minute session where they'll go through what they are doing, on their kind of business uh, business aims and uh, business targets and objectives. Uh, and then at the end of each set of three presentations, we'll have some time for questions and answers. In the meantime, if you want to ask any questions, there is a question and answer facility. Uh, you just have to tap in there. It's really very easy to use. Even I could use it and I'm terrible at that kind of thing. Um, and we will have quarter of an hour. So roughly speaking, after our first guest at 2.15, then at 3.15, there will be some more questions. And then at 4.15 to 4.30, there'll be a last uh, section for question and answers where we're going to some of the people who've been speaking. We're aiming to finish at 4.30. Okay, so without further ado, um, I thought I would uh, ask uh, Anthony Chow from Agronomics to come on um, and really talk us through what's been happening in the portfolio. Over to you, Anthony. Indeed. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, so also thank you very much to everyone for uh, joining us for the Agronomics Capital Markets Day. Uh, it has been actually 18 months since we held our last event and moving forward, uh, we're going to make a concerted effort to provide you with more regular uh, and direct information flow from our portfolio companies because we believe that not only are our portfolio companies but the sector as a whole is at a critical juncture uh, where we uh, are beginning to see a transition from companies in the research and development phase moving into commercialization as the first approvals start to roll in uh, in both Singapore as well as other major jurisdictions with the most important one, of course, being uh, the, the US. And you will have noted, hopefully, that Solar Foods received its approval of its novel protein Solene in Singapore, uh, which certainly is a landmark event uh, for that company uh, on a standalone basis. So uh, as David said, you're going to hear from me first, a, a quick update on agronomics, and then you will, we've structured the day, or the, sorry, the event, I should say, uh, with an hour on precision fermentation companies, and then an hour from cell culture companies. These are some, but certainly not all, of the most exciting companies in our fields. And a reminder that agronomics, as well as these companies, are supported by some major secular trends uh, from climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, ocean sustainability, animal welfare. Uh, and the one thing that has really increased, uh, unfortunately, in response to the uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine uh, is issues and sensitivities around food security, because it is the case today that we cannot feed our population with current consumption patterns and production me methods, let alone the additional few billion people which are gonna be on the planet uh, in the coming, uh, coming decades. Um, agronomics uh, is, remains pretty much the only way that investors, public or private, can get concentrated exposure to the field of cellular agriculture. Uh, we continue to benefit from our early mover advantage and the profile that we have uh, in terms of attracting new companies uh, to the portfolio. We have 24 companies uh, at the moment. We've raised £135 million uh, since inception, and we have £37 million of cash uh, on our balance sheet. And even more importantly, we have very supportive, a variety of very supportive investors, including large institutional investors such as BlackRock, can accord uh, and due to their asset management. Because of that strong balance sheet and cash position, uh, it is important to note that we have no immediate plans or indeed requirements uh, to raise, uh, raise funds. But of course, uh, this industry is growing rapidly and we intend on doubling down on the companies within our portfolio, which we consider 
are tr progressing to become the behemoths uh, in this field. So we invest in three key verticals. We've got the cell culture companies, precision fermentation companies, and the enabling technologies uh, for both of those. Very quickly, and I know you're going to hear from these companies, but the cell culture companies is where you take a sample of cells from whichever species of animal you wish. You isolate the stem cells, you provide them with the environment uh, that they need to grow and they experience exponential growth. But the trick then is to get those cells to differentiate into the specialized cell type that you want. And for meat, that is muscle and fat cells primarily. But in the case of leather, and you'll be hearing from Vitro Labs shortly, that is fibroblasts, which express collagen onto a scaffold. Uh, and Vitro Labs has a commercial supply agreement in place uh, with carrying one of the world's largest fashion houses. Precision fermentation has been of increasing interest uh, to agronomics, even though we did make our first investment back in 2019, uh, the last 12 months has seen a very significant increase in exposure there. And part of the reason for that increased exposure is because of the nearer term opportunity for revenue generation, in addition with lower regulatory risk uh, and the scale up challenges being somewhat limited. This has fantastic applications in the production of dairy proteins, of egg proteins, uh, and uh, yeah, you're gonna hear from very, some very exciting companies there. And then finally, the enabling technologies. We have only made one investment here, and it is a really exciting company, one that I anticipate in the coming years has the potential to return multiples of agronomics current market cap, because this is where the trillions of dollars are going to de be deployed if cellular agriculture is going to make a meaningful contribution and dent to the world's uh, food um, production. But regardless of the vertical um, that we have, uh, that we're talking about here, um, we have always focused on the companies with the technologies which have the potential uh, to really reach parity in terms of price, taste, and convenience of conventional uh, production methods. And to quote a company within the field, although not in our portfolio of prolific machines, there is no likely world in which a meaningful cost premium above functionally equivalent alternatives achieves massive scale and consequential impact. And in terms of impact, I think you know this story, but I will run through it very, very quickly. Animal husbandry is extremely burdensome on the natural environment, whether it is greenhouse gas emissions, where the estimates are up to 26% of all uh, global emissions, water consumption, 50%, all 70% of all crops that we grow uh, are fed to animals because animals are inherently very inefficient at converting calories of feed to calories of flesh. And there is no doubt in my mind that in the coming decades, we will look back upon the 80 billion animals every year and the 2 trillion fish that we slaughter uh, in disgust. And then on top of that, you have issues around uh, antimicrobial resistance and the mass consumption of medically important antibiotics, uh, which has the potential to create uh, yet another pandemic, which I think we can all agree was very, very disruptive to our daily lives. Here are the uh, the metrics uh, to give you some sense of just how efficient cultivated meat is compared to its plant-based alternatives and conventional production, uh, conventionally produced beef counterparts, massive reductions across these four metrics, greenhouse gas emissions, land use, water, uh, and energy. Indeed, the, the naysayers of this industry focus in on energy, but I'd like to remind you that animal husbandry in the first place is not energy intensive. European agriculture only accounts for 3.3% of total energy consumption uh, uh, and uh, animal husbandry is just a fraction of that. So uh, a, a little bit of a, a red herring. Now, the elephant in the room is of course that the plant-based alternative proteins have performed extremely poorly, particularly in terms of their share price. Oatly, uh, and Beyond Meat peaked in their market caps around $14 billion and today are uh, below a billion dollars. And this is because in our view that these products simply do not meet consumer expectations, uh, sensory profile expectations. So, uh, you know, we back in 2019, we effectively took the decision that we were not gonna participate 
uh, meaningfully uh, and have only made two very modest investments in this field. And that turned out to be prescient because clearly uh, this has been a challenge and I, I, it gives me no pleasure to, to talk about the, the shortfall in these, uh, in these products because they have very much paved the way and raised the awareness of this industry as a whole. But we have focused on the second and third waves of innovation that are coming over the top of the plant-based alternative proteins being precision fermentation and cell culture. And for you as investors in our company or potential investors from an intellectual property standpoint and long-term sustainable uh, advantage perspective, we think that our companies are set to become very, very valuable companies uh, in these. Um, I would like to remind you also that this industry is still really young. The first precision fermentation company for food applications was the Every Company in 2014. Uh, 2016 saw uh, the founding of Mosa Meat uh, and Upside Foods. And those are two of the most well-funded companies in the sector. And we do anticipate that within the next 12 months, the FDA and the USDA are going to be approving some products uh, although it remains to be seen which, uh, which companies uh, they will be. Um, but then on the precision fermentation side, we have already seen the approval of dairy proteins from now not just Perfect Day, but also Remilk based in Israel, uh, the every company. And again, we're no, not only are we going to see these approvals, but we're going to see the companies coming in behind, not taking seven years and $700 million to get their products onto the market, uh, but they will be approved much, much faster uh, and hopefully uh, with uh, production methods that will drive the unit economics down quite substantially. And then we, of course, have the various forecasts out there, but I, uh, AT Kearney is one that I like to point out that they forecast 35% of the global meat market is going to be produced using this technology uh, by 2040, and that is a $1.8 trillion industry. But the other elephant in the room is, of course, capacity. And this is referring more specifically to precision fermentation. Uh, there simply isn't enough capacity, uh, and not even close, uh, to meet the coming wave of demand for high inclusion proteins, such as dairy proteins uh, and egg proteins. And it, this is exactly why we have gone on to back Mark Warner uh, and Ethan Benheim uh, in Liberation Labs. It further exacerbating the issues around precision fermentation and contract manufacturing capacity is that the installed fleet of contract manufacturers are primarily based in Europe and they are 40 to 60 years old on average. They were designed for pharmaceutical purposes. Um, but unfortunately, because these the operations of these facilities are very sensitive to the energy prices, they are no longer viable for these relatively low value proteins. So Liberation Labs, you're gonna hear from shortly, uh, is looking to build its first facility the, to be up and running uh, in two and a half years time. And like I said, that is one uh, to be very excited about. Here you can see uh, uh, the, the, the portfolio construction. This was very deliberate. Uh, we have constantly stayed focused on the major protein categories, beef, pork, chicken, seafood, dairy, eggs. These are multi-hundred billion dollar industries, uh, luxury leather goods uh, as well in that order. And our waiting to uh, sell culture companies and precision fermentation, if you bundle the infrastructure play, uh, is approximately equal now. Our geographical focus remains global. Um, uh, and we are. It, the reality is that we are not seeing many new companies uh, in this field uh, going head to head with some of the most advanced uh, advanced players out, uh, out there. 24 companies, but we've only really got 11 of material consequence, but that is not by accident. These are companies that we have very high conviction in. And as I also said, uh, we anticipate will grow, grow to be some of the behemoths in this field. This gives you a sense of the geographic diversification of our portfolio. We, you'll hear from All G Foods, our first Australian investment, um, that we continue to scour the globe. And we have only a handful of names that we're currently considering that could make the cut for uh, our portfolio. 
So to allow for some question time, more question time than perhaps was planned, I'll end in summarizing uh, agronomics and cellular agriculture. This is the only technology, only credible technology that has the potential to create food security uh, for the world. This is one of the most significant ESG opportunities uh, of our time. And this is the beginning of a multi-decade, multi-trillion dollar run of capital. Uh, and the awareness of this industry continues to remain extremely low. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna ask a few questions first. Um, I'll also be checking down the Q&A section just to remind everybody <clears throat> there is a Q&A section running. So you can ask to Anthony anyway. Um, <clears throat> Anthony, I'm gonna kick off though with a couple of practical questions. Um, What's the current NAV, net asset value at the moment? Uh, the uh, NAV per share is currently just over 16p. Um, now, that is under IFRS. We believe that there is still significant intrinsic value that hasn't yet been able to be recognised, and we consider that it is probably more like 19p, even in the face of these challenging markets, we continue to see this as a bright spot in private funding markets and companies, even though they're not achieving valuation increases, uh, perhaps that they would have in, in uh, you know, the, be before the market meltdown, we are seeing uplifts uh, in these companies and the, the capital is continuing to flow. No, just sorry, just that you said it might be 19p. What do you mean by how, where do you get that? That I mean, it's an estimate. Well, um, I think this is it's it's not even <clears throat> making um, you know too much blue sky in blue Nalu that you're about to hear from uh, is carried on our balance sheet uh, at a relatively conservative valuation back from from when we made our investment in 20, uh, 2020. So that you've said you've got two years. Of very rapid progress there that that uh, you know, and I don't know what value that, that that should be carried at, but it is certainly materially higher than two years ago. And there are a number of instances uh, where uh, where where that is the case. Okay, um, you you mentioned that you got thirty seven million in cash. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to put that mostly to work in new companies, or are you going to stick with the companies that you've already got in the portfolio? Mm. Well, look, our universe of companies, keeping in mind, we started investing in this field in 2018. At that point, there were only around 20 companies uh, in the field. Today, that is just, our, our investable universe is under just under 300. Um, but a large proportion of those companies has been formed in the relatively recent future. And what we've also seen is that the companies that are being formed are not going head to head with those really well-funded leaders in the major categories. And we're seeing more and more niche applications of cellular agriculture, such as foie gras and cultivated crocodile <laughs> and kangaroo and quail and, and, and things like that. So, you know, we have been, we've, we've stuck with the major protein categories. We think we have category leaders uh, in pretty much all of those. And so uh, rather than add additional companies to the portfolio, we are probably far more focused than I would definitely say the majority of capital that we have at the moment is going to flow into our existing portfolio rather than new opportunities. Um, I'll just pick up on it, but just one other person asked that the slides and the recordings will be shared, uh, and I believe they will be shared after the event. So don't worry if you want to come back and look at anything. You you will we will have access to them. Just just picking up on that point, Anthony. Um, one person's asked, do you look at some of the more alternative areas like insects or algae as protein alternatives? Um, they, they certainly seem interesting, don't they? Yeah, look, the, the use of insects, uh, at least in the West, I think has applications uh, or potential applications in feed for animals rather than uh, for direct human consumption. Obviously in Asia, mm. uh, humans consume pretty uh, significant amounts of insects, um, but we don't think that that is going to be a likely transition for the West. Um, so that's not something that, uh, we have gone into huge depth. And the other issue, well, our algae companies, look, we have looked at one or two of these. Um, technology uh, around algae has been around for a very long time. We haven't seen any really material winners come out of that. Um, okay. And uh, so it wasn't anything, we, we've not seen anything that has compelled us to, to really move there. Now, a couple of questions here asking about the process of selecting companies in the due diligence process. 
Could you just run us through that? How do you alight upon new companies and how do you work out which company? So I presume you start with, do you start with a vertical segment? Uh, I don't know, say, uh, you know, precision fermentation and get the best companies in that segment or talk us through how that works. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, because we started early and we are one of the most active and certainly largest investors um, in this field, we find ourselves in a pretty privileged position where, you know, any entrepreneur that is starting a company or spinning out of academia uh, knows that we are a funding source uh, for cellular agriculture. So, you know, that is the case, but um, you know, the, the best deals don't necessarily walk through your door. Um, and I think Onogo, for example, is a good example of that, where, um, you know, we took the initiative uh, following our investment in solar foods. Uh, when we were traveling to, to Finland for the board meeting, we asked around, asked people to make introductions, and we stumbled across Maya. Um, so, look, it's a, it's a, a, a very active approach um, to deal sourcing, but it's also the case that the cadence of new deals coming across our desk particularly in this challenging environment, has uh, slowed down quite considerably. But look, I, I mentioned in our, my presentation that if the technology here has no prospects of getting to, to scale uh, and to parity in terms of price, taste, and convenience, uh, then it's not something that, that we can look at. So we focus very much in on uh, the ability of the team to get cells to an efficiency level or strains to an efficiency level where they are able to replicate or produce proteins very, very efficiently. Um, we have a, 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 an advisory team with uh, technical expertise, but we also have a panel of technical experts uh, ranging from stem cell biologists to bioprocess uh, experts and, and so forth. And we, uh, we call upon a, a relevant panel of those to really dive deep uh, once we've uh, established that we want to uh, take a really close look at these companies. A uh, good question here from Peter Paul, actually. Um, have all the companies in the portfolio got enough cash to be able to get them to the next stage? Because that's crucial in venture capital. Um, you, know, you, you know, it's no good having great technology. It's no good getting a great idea up and running if you don't have the cash to get down that runway. Are all of them in a good position? Yeah, pretty much all of our portfolio companies are in a, a pretty strong position. Uh, by definition, in the world of venture, you know, every co company is sort of running out of money by the time it is approaching, uh, uh, you know, a milestone, which should lead to a, uh, um, hopefully, a material change in, in, in valuation. So we always, uh, when we're leading rounds, uh, or even when we're investing, we ensure that the minimum amount of capital is achieved in the first close uh, that will allow a company to uh, to, to hit the various milestones, uh, whatever those might be, uh, that are relevant for the stage of the company. Okay, so I'll do some quick. Actually, I'll do some quick fire questions because we've got lots of questions coming in. So, mm -hmm. uh, planning a uh, planning a move from I think you're able listed, aren't you, to main market? We have a medium term goal to get into the FTSE 250, uh, and that would require a shift. Um, to a, uh, a, a higher market. Um, it, it, there have been no, no uh, formal decisions made by the board, and, and I don't think we're in a rush to make any decisions like that. But certainly, it is something that could be considered if it opens up additional pools of capital uh, when we wish to come back to the market. Okay. Um, are you planning any dilutive share issues in the future? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a tough market as we speak. Uh, it's uh, Thursday the 3rd. The markets mm. are tanking again. Uh, there are lots of red on the screen so you know it's not a great time to be issuing new shares no that's right it's not a fun market uh, at the moment but you know 37 or so million pounds of cash means that we have no requirement uh to to raise additional funds i think that this uh this capital will take us well into uh q2 maybe even q3 of next year in terms of our ability uh to do deals um the operating costs of agronomics are, are very limited. We don't need a team of 20 analysts because the universe of companies is so small and we're sticking to our knitting, uh, you know, cell culture, precision fermentation and the, the enabling technologies. Uh, quick question, the other good quick question here. Um, what's the skin in the game of the, of the people on the board and the managers? Uh, do you have skin in the game? Uh, yes, I do. And all of this is, uh, is public information. Um, Jim Mellon continues to own something in the order of 
uh, 15% and the other directors, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but certainly all the directors have skin in the game. Um, let's talk about regulation quickly. There's a lot of questions coming up about regulation. Um, mm. but first question here from Florid. Um, the EU's novel food regulation, um, is that a potential showstopper? Because that, that does put some of this stuff into a different category, doesn't it? Potentially. Yes, look, it's a really unfortunate position for the EU. The UK is different to the EU, of course, uh, now um, after Brexit. Um, it is not our base case assumption that uh, the EU is going to approve either precision fermentation products or cell culture products in reality, probably for, uh, you know, might be even five years. But it doesn't really matter uh, that much because the pathway for approvals in uh, the US is very clear on the precision fermentation products, hence you've got the products on the market. Uh, and the US is also showing really significant leadership on the cell culture side. So we do anticipate approvals there. And the reason why I say Europe is not an issue is because such is the scale of the US market on a standalone basis that there is no prospect of saturating that market probably for 20 years, maybe even more, because the infrastructure, like this isn't Google or Facebook, um, and, and it's, you know, you can have a billion users overnight, you need to build out, pro you know, proper production facilities, large scale facilities. And that is something that is just going to take time. Uh, thank you. Steve pointed out the minute I said that the markets went down, actually, the markets went up again. So uh, well, keep <laughs> the, talking. Yeah, the FTSE 100 has <laughs> gone up. Thank you, Steve. Um, OK, uh, just talk just quickly finish off uh, with the last minute or two, Anthony, um, just about Asia as well. Asia is really important, isn't it? Singapore's already got the first approvals for um, mm. for, for some cultured meat. Uh, what do you think is happening in Asia? What's the key thing you would pull out in Asia? Is China going to be a big market? Um, well, firstly, I would say that we anticipate that Japan is possibly going to be a pretty okay. fast follower after the US. That's a very large uh, population. But uh, China, a little bit less uh, clear, although um, cellular agriculture was specifically mentioned this year in yeah. their five year agricultural plan. So yeah. they're not blind to the opportunity here. Um, and I think that they all become very pragmatic when it comes to feeding their population if there is any sense of, of food shortages, because that is the sort of thing that could create social unrest. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, one last question here. Um, it, it's actually quite a few questions are roughly asking the same thing. Mm -hmm. Which of your portfolio companies do you think will first get regulatory approval for their products? Oh, that is a very good question. You know, there's possibly five or six that are all coming into the station um, at the same time, like London buses. So I, I, I dare not uh, answer directly on that. I'm sure I'll get it wrong. Uh, but it's going to be an exciting 12 months. OK, actually, that, that, instead of identifying one company. <laughs> and by the way, five or six buses in the London bus cast, that's doing well, usually about one. Uh, but uh, when do you think it will happen? When do you think, uh, so rather than name a company, when do you think you'll have the first product by a portfolio company will get regulatory approval? Yeah, look, I, I, I certainly hope within 12 months that, that one of our companies okay. will have a product uh, on, on the market. OK, great. Um, lovely. I think we're going to leave it there. Anthony, uh, lots of questions <laughs> lobbed at you. Um, and I'm going to say thank you very much for now. Uh, and I'm going to basically thank you, Anthony. And I'm going to ask uh, Jan Pakak, who's from uh, All G Foods from Down Under, um, Jan, can you hear me? Are you there? Well, I think we have to unmute you. Hello, Jan. Yes. Good afternoon from Australia. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, what time is it over there at the moment? It is 1.30 a.m. But oh. that's, uh, we're always like that. We're in the wrong time zone. <laughs> but uh, in return, we have uh, beautiful cities here. So uh, <laughs> so hope that uh, you can all hear me well and and see the screen hope that the technology is working if not please please let me know but but again good afternoon from australia as you probably can hear i'm not originally australian uh in fact came here 12 years ago from europe got a german passport a czech passport and and also an aussie passport but uh, we have incepted the company in australia and uh, our main target region is Asia Pacific and we are a future of dairy company you see the picture here we can 
and we aim to recreate everything we love about dairy, but in a very sustainable way and in a very healthy way. And so with that, let me very simply start with a simple question. We all associate dairy, which is a almost one trillion US dollar market industry, eight hundred billion billion growing approximately two to 3% every year. We all associate, of course, that with a bottle of milk, which is the product that we get from a, from a cow. But of course, we use that milk and process it in multiple different ways and then create so many different products that we all love from cheeses to chocolate to anything in pasta or high-end uh, nutraceuticals. And so what is really milk? Milk is ultimately almost 90% water. It is 9% uh, of fats or carbohydrates, but the really valuable part of milk is approximately 3.3% of the proteins that make dairy what really dairy is. And those 3.3% proteins are very, very hard to replicate. And that's exactly what we as a company are focusing on. And so you can see here, apologies again to get a little bit scientific, but if we dig one level deeper, seven of the following proteins that you can see on the left-hand side ultimately make what milk is. It's four of the casein proteins and three of the whey proteins, including lactoferrin. And we as a company have in a, a, I dare to say, very fast time been able to replicate all those seven dairy proteins at, uh, at great success levels and also were able to, to assemble the casein proteins into a stable casein micelle, which ultimately is the building block of what makes milk milk and what makes dairy really dairy. You can also see we launched a patent in that space, which is unique to us. Now, I, a little bit, you know, what we're building and what are really the advantages against traditional dairy, which uh, is, is this $800 billion industry today, as well as against plant-based alternative we all I'm sure would have tasted oat milk or or almond milk. So let's start really what the benefits are for the consumer. You know, our dairy products are significantly superior. We can target those and make those only with A2 proteins free from lactose, which particularly in Asia for almost every consumer is a big issue, free from cholesterol, hormones and antibiotics which is significantly better than traditional animal dairy, which contains cholesterol, less lactose and so on. And plant-based, while it doesn't have some of those containments, you know, it, it typically is very, very low on proteins and certain vitamins. Sustainability, won't repeat that, and had spoken about that, significant game changer in terms of CO2 emissions, land use and water use, obviously no animal welfare, but you know, where we win significantly against plant-based is, is it is the identical taste and texture and all the things that we love about dairy. I personally, and maybe some of you might like oat milk or almond milk, but I've never had a delicious or amazing plant-based cheese, chocolate, or all those other applications that, of course, we can easily replicate. So how are we going to aim to the market? There's seven different proteins. We engineered those, those proteins in separate work streams. And if I really start with our end ambition, we believe and have an ambition to become the largest dairy precision fermentation company in Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific is 45% of the global dairy market. So by far the biggest market worldwide. And this is our ambition. We're gonna enter the market in three waves. And wave one is we're going to be in market, I dare to say, with a relatively high degree of certainty in 2024 in Singapore. We're lodging for approval in Singapore in the first half next year. And then we, we were given maximum 12 months to be approved for that. And what do we want to launch? You can see some of the products that Beta like the Globalin, which is the first protein that we're going to be launching, can be used in from whey proteins, cheeses, yogurts, and ice creams. And we've achieved those expression levels and productivity, which ultimately results in a favorable cost position for the end consumer in a, I dare to say, very, very fast time. So that's our, that will be our first product, you know, followed by lactoferrin, probably not as well known to the average consumer, but lactoferrin is a very, very scarce protein. 
that can be found in dairy or in milk, it's only 0.01% of the milk bottle. So it makes it very difficult to create. You need ultimately millions of liters of milk to create kilograms of lactoferrin. And the cost is uh, around $1,000 per kilogram. And we can do that through synthetic biology by basically targeting this protein as such. We, to the best of our knowledge, are one of only a handful of companies in the world. And given the cost position of this protein, it, it will be significantly faster to cost parity. And what are the use cases? All the use cases are the very valuable things like nutraceuticals, infant formula, uh, growth hormones, uh, and many more things. And again, our ambition is to submit regulatory approval in 2024 with the view that we're going to launch this in market in late 24 or, or 25. And the third wave, which is, of course, by far the biggest market, are caseins. Caseins are what makes milk milk and the, the hard cheeses, the hard cheeses. This is, this is by far the biggest market. We can then replicate uniquely, basically, I dare to say, every product that are in dairy. As I had mentioned before, we launched a patent which is worldwide unique in terms of how to assemble caseins into a stable building block, which is called the casein micelle. And uh, we continue to progress a lot of science in, in terms of for the third wave launch for that. Now, why can we all do that? This is a little bit of a very techy picture here, but the purpose of the, of the, of the slide is to give you all confidence that we're building highly unique in-house IP where we're building unique strain libraries that are proprietary to the company and uh, in, in very high throughput, we're, we're having a lightning fast automation fermentation lab, which allows us to basically constantly screen for optimized expression levels of those proteins. What is the use case against for the consumer? This ultimately allows us to become to get to a better and better cost position, which ultimately will make the product cheaper and cheaper. We believe Price parity is less than a decade away, clearly less than a decade. Again, depends on protein. In some proteins, I'd say maybe three, four years away, but it doesn't stop there. This is once price parity achieved, unlike the cow, we are constantly improving our expression levels. And there will be a time, I'm very much convinced about that. There's no certainty, but mathematically, it is absolutely possible where we will be under the price of animal dairy with a superior product. This is a picture of our team and why can we move so fast? We as a company are less than two years old, but we imported a lot of unique knowledge, you know, on the science side. We have this picture, in fact, is outdated now. We're now a team of slightly over 50 and have uh, 25 PhDs, a globally assembled team of experts in the world that, uh, that are all experts in, in certain unique fields. You know, two highlights. We have the number one casein expert in the world, Dr. Carl Holt, who actually resides in the UK. And we also, our chief scientist officer was the first person in the world who has assembled a stable casein micelle already seven or eight years ago. And, and we have him and his knowledge, you know, that he's deeply researched for almost a decade and that allows us to accelerate all the progress that we have in the company. But myself, this is uh, not my first company, you know, I, I started my working life in multinationals running up to billion dollar P&Ls and scaling those, but also realized it's much more fun to build companies and uh, and got lucky twice. You know, I, I started a consumer technology company, which was listed on the Australian Stock Exchange when public two years ago. So had an exit and, uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say all investors were happy. And did that for a second time with another company, which was acquired two years ago or one year ago by KKR, which is one of the largest uh, private equities. And uh, and of course, you know, plan to make this significantly bigger, uh, given the opportunity is much bigger and much more global. And the commercial team, again, you see some of the companies, Unilever, Nestle, we have people that scale businesses from zero to $500 million. So we have a well-equipped team to take this and make this a big business. You know, customers, of course, and offtake is important. We're not only, we're not only focusing on the science, but are very, very early 
wanting to ensure that we have immediate offtake. And there's a lot of inbound coming from companies to us, you know, in Asia Pacific, a lot of dairy companies, particularly those that are thinking very innovatively about the future, see this as a huge opportunity in terms of how to further differentiate, not necessarily as competition, but more as a new technology stream to basically how to be able to differentiate for the, for the consumer, decarbonize their supply chains. And frankly, in certain countries, and including, for example, China and Japan, they simply do not have enough cows. So, so this is not a competition for some of them, but much more a necessity. But, but the, the picture on the slide is details about Woolworth. Woolworth is, is one of the largest top 10 global or, or Woolworth specifically based in Australia retailers with uh, $65 billion in revenues and an unparalleled distribution network of thousands of uh, supermarkets, you know, similar size to Tesco in the UK. And they became a shareholder and we have a strategic partnership with them. So when we immediately launch, this of course is a, is a great advantage in terms of guaranteeing offtake in Australia as well as in Asia. Last but not least, you know, and Anthony had mentioned that, you know, scaling up is a challenge because it is a very, very new industry and uh, the infrastructure to support the ambitions to feed a growing population is lagging behind. And, and this is where we're privileged to work with Döhler, which is a German company who have bioreactors of different sizes and scales to help us to optimize the process from pilot scale to large scale. And we're working with them. And last but not least on the right hand side, and I believe this is a great uh, uh, a pass on to Mark, who's the speaker af after me. We are very enthusiastic about agronomics investment into liberation labs. And whenever the first facility or the second facility comes online, we already talked to Mark. We're the first very enthusiastic customers how to be able to make our proteins at large scale. With that, I hope I was exactly on time. I hand over to you, David, again. Thank you. Can you hear me okay now, Jan? Perfect. Excellent. Apologies. It sounded like I apparently um, went underwater for the last 30 seconds. Um, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, and a brilliant segue uh, to Mark Warner from Liberation Labs. Now, I must say, Mark is not responsible for the next headline, but it was a great headline reporting on his website from the New York Times, which was how agriculture could go from farming to firming, as in precision fermentation. What a, I have to say, I about put a smile on my face in terms of uh, headlines. Mark, tell us a little bit more about precision fermentation and your plans for world domination. Please, I will do. Um, it's not letting me share. If whoever could let me... I think uh, Jan has to stop sharing first. Yeah, apologies, everybody. Uh, whilst right. trying to coordinate everybody, we've got to get there our technology go. working. Okay. Here we go. Over to you. Okay. Sorry, get up to the top of the deck. So, and uh, hopefully that's it right there. Yeah. Appreciate the time. Um, love to talk to you about Liberation Labs today. Um, my co-founder, Aton Bendheim, I'm not sure if I see him, but hopefully he's on. We founded Liberation Labs here earlier this year, um, really with the help of agronomics. We see them as a founding partner. They had approached us to, to help fill this gap and form the company. And we're, we're very excited to really help fill that space. Um, my background, chemical engineer by background, um, as you can tell by my gray hair, I've been doing this a long time, um, worked in the chemical industry, the engineering industries, um, was in-house a couple times. I was with um, Solazyme as their senior vice president of engineering, built a very large fermentation facility about 10 years ago in Brazil, was with Impossible Foods as their chief engineering officer in the early days. And my specialty is really scale up and commercialization of novel biotechnology. Um, Aton, are you there? Guess not. So uh, I'm here. There he goes. Go ahead. Sure. So I'll, I'll just be very, very brief. Uh, my background uh, is in mostly in pharmaceuticals uh, and operating roles. 
uh, and about four and a half years now in the precision fermentation industry, both uh, as a uh, startup looking to bring bring uh, bring products to market, as well as uh, a CMO operator uh, at a, uh, a one and a half million liter facility in the U.S. Um, so I'll turn back over to Mark, but, but really excited to present Liberation Labs to you all. Great, thanks. So as we like to say, we're facilitating the future of food. So you're going to hear from these great technology providers today. Jan was an example and others that, that are developing these great technologies. The challenge is where to make their products at. Because today, and I'm, I think many people have heard of this in the industry, there's just not a lot of capacity. And this, this graph, this figure here really shows it. So if you look at the glass over on the right, the dark green at the bottom is the capacity for um, biotech fermentation, industrial fermentation that would be used to make these food products today. It's about 61 million liters worldwide. Um, depending on, Anthony mentioned the A.T. Kearney study earlier, I think this one mentions Boston Consulting Group, which either of those studies you pick, you're going to see that there's a dramatic increase projected in fermentation capacity need for precision fermentation in the range of 50% increase in the next um, five year, well, I guess three years at this point, somewhere between three to tenfold by 2035. What's two points I want to get across today are one, we do believe there's going to be that growth. But even if that growth doesn't turn out as fast as we expect, we believe there's reasons that Liberation Labs can compete very significantly against uh, who is out there today. And if you look at the left, you'll see some of the reasons. Um, the, the biggest thing is the facilities that people were using really weren't built to make novel proteins. Um, the, the incumbent CMOs and the next slide, I'll dig down a little into those. They're great facilities, they're doing wonderful work, but as you're gonna see from this next slide, they just weren't set for the purpose they're intended to be serving, which is novel protein. So this, this chart is our visual representation of how we see the CMO market. We take that 61 million liters and we pick the 2025 20, largest um, CMOs in the space. This represents about 50 million of the 61 million liters. Size of the bubble is the capacity of the facility in fermentation. Along the bottom is the year it was built. And along the left is what we're called a food readiness rating, um, meaning are they really making novel food proteins today? Um, the green ones are regularly doing that. Um, the yellow ones can do it potentially in some form. It usually means they have fermentation capacity. It very often means they don't have the downstream they need. And then our facilities I'm gonna talk about on the upper right are in the dark green. We're starting in uh, each of our geographies with a 600,000 liter, what we're calling launch facility. It is a commercial facility. It is very profitable, but it's on the smaller end of commercial scale. Ultimately, we expect to build up to uh, 4 million liters in each of six geographies. So in the range of 24 million liters total. And later on, I'll show you those geographies. And that's important because if you're like a major um, CPG looking to take one of these novel ingredients, put it into a product, that's a problem today because this network of older CMOs, um, it, it's usually for the vast majority of it, it's in Europe. That's where most of these facilities built for things like pharmaceuticals were built you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And because of that, you don't wanna hear if you're launching a product in Asia that they don't have a facility in Asia, that you have to go to a whole different CMO you've never worked with. We believe the network has to be worldwide to where if you start with us in one geography and then grow into another one, we can transfer it over to one of our other facilities. Now, I kind of skipped over a lot of the lead here, which is, the age and fit for purpose. So of all the bubbles on here, there's a couple things you'll see. First is none of them were built to make food proteins. They were built to either make pharmaceuticals or to make chemicals. Um, they weren't really intended to make food proteins. And while they can make them, 
they really can't make them very economically. If you think of things like pharmaceuticals, they're not meant to be a high throughput, high volume operation like you would expect for food processing. When you want the price points that we need for food, because I think we all believe to get the really the adoption we all expect, we need to get those price points down closer to parity. It, it's going to be difficult to do those here. The other thing is I would ask you to look at just the age. You're going to see the majority of this capacity is in the range of 50 years old. And every time I say that number, it surprises me, but you can go through each one of these dots is a specific facility. I would say that many of these are at the end of their useful life. Some would argue they're beyond it because these were probably a 30 year asset when they were built. So this is really the competition and what's out there today. So let's, let's talk about what we as Liberation Labs intend to build. And this um, graphic on the upper right, this is actually an extraction from our engineering um, CAD model. We're currently in site development of a site in the US. It's our first launch facility. Um, we expect to announce that site here in the next couple months. And that facility is expected to be operational in 2024. So this is the first 600,000 liter um, facility. And there's some things here that I want to point out that we think are, are really the things that will make us different. So first, this is going to be the first facility built specifically for precision food proteins, the kind of things that Jan talked about a minute ago, and certainly others, the, the dairies, the, the egg proteins, things like a heme and other products that we've um, seen as these key kind of often called a, a hero ingredient that gets brought in to, to bring the, the marketability that Anthony talked about to give it the products, the functionality and to act like the products we expect to buy. So um, the adaptability is important to us, the cost we talked about and really that global first mover advantage. So next slide. So let's talk specifically about what we intend to build. So what we're trying to do with, with our facilities is build a facility that's a, a platform that can serve all the leading companies. So we've targeted what we believe is about 80% of the kind of the landscape out there of these precision food proteins, and they all have a general configuration they need. Aseptic aerobic fermentation, centrifugation and microfiltration to remove the the cells at the end of the fermentation, ultrafiltration, which will hold those food proteins while salts and other things are washed out of them, and then spray drying. This assumes it's a dried product. These will be a lot of the B2B ingredients that go into these products. And the items in yellow below, we think are very important and kind of underrepresented in many ways in the current network out there today. Many of these strains rely on a feedstock of methanol. Um, a lot of the yeasts do. It's one of the things that triggers them to produce the proteins that are expected. And just things like continuous sterilization and the ability to handle GMO that's critical to make these products. It's much of the difference today with what's out there where they can make the products, they just can't make them in the cost range that are necessary. So let's talk next about geography. We're targeting six geographies ultimately, US, Middle East, and Australia. That's our first uh, kind of phase one's targets. Brazil, Europe, and Southeast Asia secondarily. Now, how did we pick those? If you look at the lower right, um, this represents the cost structure from a large scale commercial fermentation facility. I can tell you this from experience because I've built and operated these facilities before. Sugar, labor, and power are roughly 70 to 75% of the total manufacturing cost. So what's important is to find a site that not only has all three of those, but all three have to be a reasonable cost. If just labor's cheap, but power and sugar are expensive, it's really not a good target area. So we've picked the US for our first um, location. 
That's um, certainly because of cost, the sugar, la the labor, the power, but also because of markets. As we talked, you heard talk about earlier, most of the markets to sell these are the U.S. today. It's where the most need of capacity is, and it's where the markets are. So it's where we believe um, our focus needs to be for this first facility. Um, secondarily, we're looking at the Middle East and Australia currently as our phase one targets, and then Brazil, um, Europe, and Southeast Asia secondarily. Part of that also comes around some of the feedstocks that are available, not just the price, but the type of feedstocks. Um, when we talk sugar in the U.S., it's corn dextrose. When we talk other geographies, it's sucrose, and that at times can bring some, some complication into um, some of the processes for how these are made. So it's it's something we need to be assured as that manufacturing partner that we're able to run all those processes and source the required feedstocks. So to briefly wrap up, um, our website is on here for those who haven't been able to see it yet. There was a couple snips I showed of graphics in here. Those come from a 3D model that we released on our website yesterday. I didn't want to tempt the uh, technology gods by trying to show it during this presentation, but um, would encourage any of you who kind of want to see, as we say, what the future of precision fermentation looks like. I would encourage you to visit our website and uh, take a look at that model and have appreciated the opportunity to present today. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, you'll be coming back a bit later for our panel. Um, and uh, in the meantime, uh, we are going to move over to uh, Maya Ikkonen from Onigo Bio. On a, Maya, could you hear me? Yes, absolutely. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Maya, why don't you take us through your animal free protein? Thank you so much. So you can see my slides correctly? Absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, so uh, the, the name of my company is Onego, Onego Bio. We are based in Helsinki, Finland. And uh, we are the people behind this Onego story. So I'm the CEO. I'm the third time founder, also a designer, innovator. I have a very steady, a strong background in alternative proteins. So my previous company was in plant proteins and uh, it has provided a, a nice view for the whole industry. And my co-founder, Chris, our CTO, on the other hand, is one of the trailblazers in this whole industry. So he has been uh, running and leading this protein, uh, like a production team at the VTT. And to be honest, we are actually a, a spin out from this VTT Research Institute. This company is not very old. We were just founded last February, but we have been super busy. And uh, like Anthony was mentioning in the beginning, we almost met um, agronomics by accident. So the company was not even founded when we met them. Uh, and uh, it has been a very fast journey from, from there. So let me just put some light on our topic. So egg was invented by the mother nature about 300 million years ago. And it's a fantastic product. So it's such an amazing bundle of this great nutrition and this, this super good uh, package. But it's very difficult to uh, like uh, replace it with, with anything because it's very unique in the functionality as well. And here, 2022, we already know that this traditional way is fragile and inefficient. So one bird can just give you six grams of protein per day. And it's quite uh, vulnerable, especially uh, because of these animal originated diseases, like bird flu has been especially bad this year. Tens of millions of birds have been, have been uh, uh, slaughtered because of that. And that causes mainly these uh, price fluctuations and supply chain discontinuations. On the other hand, we have this precision fermentation method that is, is capable of providing a more robust and efficient method. If you think about that, you have one hectare of cultivated land uh, you can either produce feed for the animals and therefore produce about 200 kilos of chicken acquired, or you could turn to the bioreactors and uh, make a tenfold of that amount with even a lower production cost. Sounds like a dream. I will tell you a little bit more. 
So our secret source here is this uh, fungal platform that is called Trichoderma rhesii. And this is the special uh, platform that we have uh, licensed from this research institute. So uh, this filamentous fungus is something that has been, has been studied for a very, very long time in this VTT Institute. Uh, even like tens of years, they started with the biofuels and then moved to enzymes. And recently to say like last, past five or six years, moved to the, to the food proteins. We feed this organism with the glucose and nutrients. In the future, you could also give other stuff. It doesn't necessarily need to be pure glucose in the future. So for example, let's say food production side streams like starch, et cetera, could be a very good feed for this, for this trichoderma. And just to demonstrate that, uh, my co-founders has been, has been given a cardboard boxes for the feed of this, this, uh, this organism. So it can basically eat anything that uh, contains cellulose. Anyways, uh, it grows itself first, and then it starts segregating this protein that we call a bioalbumin. So bioalbumin is a trade name for this um, biotechnically produced egg white. It has about 90% smaller uh, environmental footprint, and it's not affected by the bird flus, salmonella, etc. But what makes this so nice and holistic is that it actually doesn't generate any side streams. So even this filaments itself, this, this uh, trichoderma itself can make very valuable materials for all kinds of like, uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, applications where you would need biodegradable materials like uh, packaging, etc. At VTD, they have even, even made uh, mycelium leather with this material. So it's a holistic system. You can feed the side streams and then what comes out is also valuable for, for some other purposes. Uh, just a short overcap still about this, um, this uh, process. So you first, first uh, grow this actual biomass, and then it's a segregating the protein. After the uh, upstream process, you filter away the, the biomass itself, the cells, the trigoderma cells, and then you have the water that has the protein dissolved in it, and then you start separating the, pro the protein from the water and drying it, and, and there you have your powder. Sometimes people ask that, why do you want to like a ship the powder, why wouldn't you just sell like liquid egg whites? But at the same time, if you think about that egg has about 90% water, it doesn't make much sense to ship the water around the world. You can just add the water back, back in, in, the, in the place where the application is made. Um, and still a few words about this technology. So uh, we clearly do believe that this trichoderma is, is a great solution for for many of these, these are problems. So Mark was just saying that the focus needs to be shifting to the, to the cost efficiency, and we totally agree here. And that this filamentous fungus has great abilities to really produce uh, these proteins in, in good scale. So it, it has the ability to have, uh, have like yields uh, more than 100 grams per liter. And the fact that it's segregation-based, that is actually in this liquid, not, uh, not so that you need to break the cells, it's also a great advantage. And even further, you are able to really produce it in a big scale bioreactors, which is certainly will be needed in the, in the mass scale manufacturing. And why do we have these palm trees here? So this is a beautiful story that the American soldiers uh, found this fungus during the World War II in the Solomon Islands, where they figured out that something is, something is eating their clothes and their tents. There were some scientists with the teams, and so they say they, they brought it home, isolated this, this fungus, and a whole new industry started from that. So this is an organism that has been proven by pharma industries, textile, biofuel, food aid, and enzyme industries. And uh, I would say that the main, main challenge in there is that it tends to eat everything what it produces, so you really need to have great technologies uh, to control these uh, proteases. And there you have lots of IP, uh, so, so it's very much controlled by, by like a certain enzyme makers and certain research institutes. But it clearly, clearly has good advantages. Then just a couple of words for the, for the competition. So um, here on the upper left-hand side, you see these plant-based egg alternatives. So these are, co these are companies that are making making like a egg alternatives from mostly legume, legumes and also some other ingredients. And uh, some of them are really nice products already and selling, selling well and, and so on and so on. 
the main thing is really the functionality. So it's super difficult to, to mimic this egg, uh, like uh, a functionalities if you don't really have the real egg. So it's a model example where the precision fermentation can absolutely help. Uh, there are not that many companies in this, in this field. So egg is clearly like a less spoken category. And most of these companies that are working there are, are working on the, on the yeast-based platforms and not the fungal platforms. So we're kind of like alone in there in our own field. And then you, of course, has, have the traditional egg white industry that is full of these gigantic big companies that nobody has ever heard of. They are only in the news when something bad happens, like, for example, bird flu is hitting them badly or, or something. Uh, but it's a very, very low margin business, a very labor intensive business. And uh, clearly, clearly we see that there's like a lot of lot of room for disruption. And uh, I guess that it doesn't surprise anyone that there are already some of these companies that are aiming to collaborate with us. So, so some of them are already seeing that they maybe there would be a better way to produce these proteins. So we started our journey only this February. So believe it or not, Onigo is only like nine months old company. We got the seed, round, seed funding around 10 million euros last February. Then we even got like a governmentally, um, like a, uh, we got this uh, grant from the Finnish government, 4.5 million. So to get a 14.5 million funding so far. And uh, after that, we have been very busy forming all kinds of partnerships, for example, with the perfect day, that is a California-based company that, that is using the same uh, platform, same uh, fungal platform, and uh, already has several products through the system. So, so they are very eager to help us in also getting our products to these FDA systems. And little by little, we are moving towards uh, manufacturing and really the commercial phase of our company. So just a recap, like a short recap on on uh, our protein. So the bioalbumin is the, is the trade name for this uh, biotechnically produced egg white. It has the same functionalities as the, as the traditional chicken egg white. It is suitable for all kinds of food processing. It also has very high nutritional profiles. And uh, we believe that in this technology, this very cost efficient technology, you can actually uh, like reach the same or even lower production cost than the chicken egg white has. You don't need to worry about this uh, animal animal origin uh, diseases or or animal welfare issues. But uh, of course, one of the main main uh, like uh, kind of like one of one of the most important issues is that you can actually avoid these supply chain discontinuations and and price fluctuations. So we totally do believe that. Even, the, even though the, the planet is the most important thing for many players, money talks and money clearly is the, is the biggest driving force. So you, if you have the ability to make something that works the same and uh, like uh, lets them to do a more steady business uh, with a better price, it's, it's clearly going to be welcomed. Okay, and here is the uh, email address if somebody wants to wants to have a contact with us. Lovely, Maya, thank you very much. Um, thank you. And uh, Maya, congratulations, both on time and actually well before time as well. Nice, nice sharp presentation. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna ask back on uh, Jan and Mark, if I can ask them to come back on. I can see you, but I can't hear you. I can see you, Mark. Yeah, great. Okay, you can all hear me okay, yes? Yes. Yeah, excellent. We've only got about uh, well, we've got twenty minutes. Um, so uh, because there's so many questions, uh, we're going to keep it quite quick fire. Okay, so um, I'm just going to rattle through. We've got a, quite a few questions coming on, so I'll rattle through some of the questions. Um, Maya, why don't we start with you? Because uh, you you just finished. Uh, uh, what about egg yolks? Are you doing them as well? Mm. Yeah, so the egg yolk is a little bit different. So it's mainly uh, consisting of this, uh, like a lipid, more like a lipid oriented uh, proteins. But uh, yeah, it could be somehow possible in the future. But the main thing is that it's not so difficult to replace the yolk with plant based ingredients once you have the functionality from the from the whites. So we are actually even like trying and testing these different uh, like a hybrid products that you would have the functionality and the binding powder power from these egg whites and then combining that with certain certain like plant-based ingredients and that makes a beautiful yolk. 
Okay. Like a whole uh, egg. Yes. And uh, just quickly, Maya, when do you reckon your product's going to hit the supermarket shelves? Uh, like when was the question? <laughs> yeah, I, I was listening. Uh, yeah, I was like, where or when? So it's going to be the United <laughs> States, and and we are looking into filing this FDA approval ne like around next summer. <clears throat> so then it takes minimum nine months from there. So, so did, you say, did you say? Did you say? Did you say next summer? Next summer filing it, and then it mm. takes about nine months uh, to actually get it through. So somewhere in 24, 2024 could be the right time. Okay, uh, same question for you, Yam. When do you get, when's your, when are your products going to be out there in the supermarket shelves? 24, uh, in Singapore, followed by most likely Australia, New Zealand, and potentially more markets in Asia. Okay, uh, and um, actually just Yam, just on you, uh, what's the more exciting? You've got plant-based stuff and you've got the milk. What's the, which, which is the more exciting one of the two? <laughs> Milk is what we do, uh, precision fermentation. Okay. That's uh, that's who we are. That's what we do. Yes, we started, you know, a plant-based business, which is more like we're generating channels and distribution partnerships with that. But the value in the company is in next-gen milk. Okay, uh, Mark, uh, quite a few questions coming up for you. Um, uh, probably because you're deep in the uh, precision fermentation engineering process, you've got quite a lot of practical questions here. Waste products. What happens to waste products in precision fermentation? I'll, I'll ask other people as well, but. Yeah, I mean, it depends. So today, you know, many people would refer to the leftover cells as waste. There are things that can be done with it. Most commonly, it would go to wastewater, gets digested and becomes methane um, gas in a wastewater treatment plant. There are certainly companies looking to upcycle that. I personally believe that's an area you'll see some progress. Because we, we have these organisms, we worry about what they're making, the protein that goes in the broth, but what's in the cell has protein and other things where mm. I do think that's where you're going to see additional um, focus in, in coming years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mark, I'll just stay with you, actually. Um, could you, what's your business model? Um, are, you, your, are you selling, leasing the bioreactors or... Do you operate them for other companies? Could you talk us through the, 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 the revenue line? Yeah, manufacturing is a service. We're a contract manufacturer. This is new to novel proteins, but it's how pharmaceuticals are made today. Mm -hmm. In the pharma industry, you basically have technology developers and manufacturers. The vaccines we all got, generally the people who developed the vaccine didn't make them. So we're looking to be a cost-effective platform. We're not doing synthetic biology and those kinds of things. We're doing very limited scale-up support. We're, we're looking for processes that are ready to manufacture, but need that larger scale, cost-effective platform. Uh, and again, actually, I'll, I'll ask you first this, Mark. Um, do any of the majors, the food majors, have fermented proteins and manufactured in volume today? Actually, does anyone do anything in scale today? Yeah. When you say food majors, for the most part, it's startups. I mean, the okay. more public ones, obviously, Impossible's had their heme burger. They've been at, at very large scale for a while. There are others that are like that. It's generally more in the startup space than what when I hear majors, I think the big ag companies and those types. They've made products for years, but generally not proteins. It's things like citric acid, lactic acid, those kind of things. And Mark, where do you expect to sign your first customer for the initial 600,000 litre facility? Say that, what was the first Sorry, uh, when? When, do you, when, yeah, when do you yeah. expect to end, sign end on your first customer? We, we, we expect our first facility to be operational in the second half of 2024 in the US. Uh, it's a good, good question was asked earlier, which is that you, you said you're solving for things like labor and sugar, and yet you had Brazil in the second wave. Because presumably Brazil has got a lot of sugar, it's got a lot of labor, uh, it's got good markets. Why aren't you, why aren't you going there first? Um, part of it is because, now I'll get a little techie, um, the type of sugar there, last facility I built was in Brazil. So I've, okay. I've built there before. It is a little more complicated labor in, and power and sugar are reasonable. Yep. Um, getting materials in and out and IP is a little more difficult than people think. But the other thing is it's sucrose, not dextrose. Not as many technologies are proven on sucrose. And the other thing is we have to remember in the end, 
Nobody can buy it there. So again, I would be yeah. manufacturing it there to bring it back to the US. So it, it's certainly still an opportunity. Um, we think there are other areas that are probably, you know, Middle East and Australia, their proximity to Asia. I mean, we're all trying to be prepared for when we expect Asia to open up to these kinds of products. Uh, and actually, Mark, a good, another good question has come in here. Uh, you talked, we talked a bit about the first 600,000 600, litre facility. How much is like, one of them like to cost? Because it sounds quite capital intensive model. Yeah, about 75 million US is our, our current estimate. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. One for you. Um, uh, I'm just reading the question, Jan. Sorry. <laughs> That's the pregnant pause. Uh, uh, <laughs> How do you make the fats and the carbohydrates in the milk? Do you outsource it um, so that you just focus on the proteins or do you make it in-house? We focus on the proteins. Yeah, we focus on the proteins in the first instance. The fats, we're working with another company in Australia, which generates specifically the precision fermented fats. So yeah. that's what we're going to include. The carbohydrates, 90% of consumers don't want that. Right. So it's really a choice if we put that in, right? Like if our market is Asia Pacific, uh, lactose, you know, sugar is is 95 percent of Asians are intolerant. So, in fact, by not doing it, we're going to give them a significant health advantage in line with other health advantages. Um, sticking with the kind of Asia Pacific theme, Jan, um, how do you think outfits? I mean, you're just across the Tasman Sea is Fonterra, yeah, the a giant in the dairy industry. Um, and New Zealand is big in milks. Yeah, aren't you going to make them redundant? <laughs> Time will tell. Uh, look, I think, as I said before, we get on the extreme, we get two types of reactions. There's very innovative companies who are reaching out to us who want to work with us because they consider a company like ours the future. Mm -hmm. They want to invest, they want to have partnerships, they want to have exclusive access to the proteins when it comes online, because they see it as a very highly innovative new segment that over time, if you kind of take a decade long view, will become the dominant segment. But you also get different reactions where people are just uh, you know, rejecting uh, the idea, I don't want to name anyone, but that's what you get. and. The, the biggest, in fact, exporter in dairy worldwide is Australia, New Zealand. Yep. And the biggest importer in dairy worldwide is China, followed by Japan. So it's very, the trade flows are very, very clear and, and it'll be interesting, right? Like I, I can't name any names of the companies that we're cooperating, but I'll, I'll stop where I say there's a lot of interest from existing dairy companies who absolutely want to be on our train and and offering a lot in return. Okay, uh, uh, this is again a question for Jan and Maya. Um, uh, actually, a couple of questions really. Uh, one, um, how do you get the consumer to really embrace this and pay extra for it? Because I presume you're going to ask them to pay extra for it for both products, unless you correct me. Um, in the beginning, in the in beginning, beginning extra. In the beginning. Okay. That's, look, every every disruption, look at electric cars, you know, it starts premium and then you move down the price curve. And that's for very clear reasons that, you know, once the technology becomes more mature, once we have more experience curve, you don't want to enter the market for a $2 uh, uh, milk bottle because I think it would be a massively missed opportunity for all the shareholders. You want to enter the market for a premium product you know, a big, a big marketing vow, and there's a lot of interest, you know, like we all probably have, or remember the the one and a half years ago in Singapore, when the first cell-based meat company was launched, it attracted global PR. That's exactly how we want to launch the first dairy products in Singapore with a lot of press, a lot of consumers. And in fact, you know, the cell-based products in Singapore are sold out all the time. Mm -hmm. So, so we're going to enter the market more premium and gradually as the industry matures, our price position gets better and better and better. We will get to more attractive price positions. On, yeah, on the have, consumer, have, you go. Yeah, I have quite similar as an, uh, a similar answer than, than Jan was giving. So uh, definitely the study with the with the higher price point categories, like for example, in our case, the functionalities are really so so clear at, as an advantage that like having this uh, 
sports nutrition products, like for example, protein, protein powders and protein shakes and, and bars and so on. There, there is a group of consumer who actually is willing to pay the premium when you get something that is ultra pure and ultra uh, great in nutrition. At the same time, there are also other segments, like for example, this um, more premium bakery sec sector that is also very highly dependent on these functionalities that you actually can't replace it with something else. But uh, I also totally do agree that, you know, like eventually, that needs to be the, the clear goal for everybody to really reach the price parity, because if we don't, then we can just forget about the competition. Um, okay, uh, I suppose a, a, a question more probably for Jan again. I, I promise to come back to you in a minute, Mark. Um, I've been avoiding you, but I will come back to you. Um, Oatly, there's a lot of, you've got a lot of competition in the, from the plant-based products out there already. And as Anthony showed at the very beginning, their share price hasn't done terribly well. And you could imagine a situation where people go, you know what, I could absolutely see the segment. Yeah, I could see there's demand for it, but I'll never make any money out of it because basically it's a very competitive marketplace and everybody will copy your innovations and they'll try and undercut you. How do you sort of, and, and Oatly, which is, by the way, great product, great brand. How do you sort of push beyond that that Oakley scenario, Oatly scenario it finds itself in. Sure. Look, so so Oatly, and I'll be a bit bold in my statement. I think Oatly has done a phenomenal job in terms of branding, but I also believe that plant-based dairy will will never go beyond 10, 15, maximum 20% of penetration. Uh, I personally love Oatly oat milk. I do not love and, and ask yourselves, do you love cheese, chocolate, you know, and many, many multiple other applications made from plant dairy? It doesn't stack up. Yeah. And we always associate dairy with milk. That's the most obvious product, but that's 3% market. 95, 97% of the yeah. market, and you mentioned Fonterra, you know, 95% of Fonterra's revenues get sold as dairy powder. Yeah. shipped to China and other Asian markets where it gets used, you know, and then assembled into local cheese, pizza, pasta, chocolate, all the sweet stuff, you know, infant formula, nutraceuticals, and so on. And this is where simply plant-based dairy will not stack up. Mm. So so that's one angle. The, the total addressable market is significantly better, bigger, because we're not changing consumer behavior. We're giving consumers what they love, the taste and texture in multiple products. Yet at the same time, we're making it healthier we're making it more sustainable and over time and i say over time we'll make it more price competitive so uh, this is a total superior proposition addressing a one trillion dollar market now is there competition absolutely there is and that's a good thing because it verifies that we're onto something if if we were the only company in a trillion dollar market something would be wrong uh, you know but unlike google or facebook i was in tech before i think this absolutely allows for multiple winners it's not a one winner take all like how many fmcg companies or large dairy companies are there today in the world and they all have certain unique strengths and weaknesses and and i if i can't project the next 10 years that's that's where we will be as well maya um one of the areas a lot of people talk about enhancing foods so that they're 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 better for you. I mean, we've seen some omega three kind of. I think omega three milks out there actually in the market. Mm -hmm. um, is there a temptation to enhance your product so to add an extra an extra special element to it so that it is even more healthier for you because that would allow you to charge more money. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is something that we clearly are seeing. Uh, just that you know, it is better to start with something quite simple and mm, quite okay. like close to the to the original one. But little by little, it certainly is possible to do all of these improvements. Like just to take a, a simple ex example, the the allergens in the egg. There, there is a group of people who just uh, mm. can't eat anything. And if you go to yeah. the bakery sector. I mean, people who don't have the egg allergy don't even understand like how big portion of the of the products actually have eggs in them. So there, there would be possible a possibility to really uh, create this kind of protein that doesn't have the allergens or has the extra formability or has the extra binding power and, and these kind of things. So it clearly is possible, but I just see that, you know, this is something that, that uh, the market will show us. Mark, I've promised to come back to you. Um, China. Mm. Um, 
It's a huge market. Uh, uh, Jan's just been talking about it with milk. Let's be honest, the Chinese Communist Party cares a lot about food security. Um, the Chinese Ch Chinese biotech industry is, is in a phenomenal learning curve at the moment. They're doing incredibly well. What's your plans for China? You know, most of our plans for China involve um, producing probably out of Australia or Southeast Asia. There, there's IP reasons um, with a lot of these strains going in. Yeah. There's also, while certainly you can make for in-country production, U.S., Europe, most of the CPGs won't won't source food out of China because of some of the legacy issues. So, you know, that certainly could change at some point. But our view today, and I agree with you on, if you look at those supply chains now, a lot of that's being served by geographic neighbors, not by China itself. And again, Mark, um, what are... The, uh, it strikes me that you're fundamentally involved more in a kind of picks and shovels play in the nicest possible way. Um, what's the unique IP that you've got? Because I can sort of understand it with Meyer and Yan. They're, 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 their unique IP is in their brand and the stuff that they put into the brand and people will get their heads around it. Where's your unique IP? Do, do you have anything that's unique within the engineering process that somebody, that just one of your massive competitors who does this, I don't know, I'm, I don't know the industry well, but DuPont, yeah, could just come along and just go, we like that, but actually we've been doing this a long time, but we're just going to do it bigger and better. The, the thing is, there are people who've been doing fermentation, but not this kind of fermentation. Yeah. Food proteins are very different. Um, even in my consulting practice, I worked for a lot of those big companies looking to get it in the space. You know, we don't have a lot of what I'd call IP. It's more trade secret. If you look at the big food manufacturers, most of what makes them unique is trade secret, not core underlying IP. Right. It, you know, certainly um, the fermenters we're in design of today um, we believe not everyone can do the ability to integrate that with the downstream. We're, we're, we're quite comfortable that our speed to market and that just the knowledge base of what it takes to make these food proteins. I mean, the biggest problem with making a food protein is often how do you keep off flavors from coming in? Yeah. How do you make a neutral egg protein that doesn't taste bitter or other things? That's usually around how the downstream is run and things that that are are pretty specific okay i think we've run out of time so uh, i'm going to thank you all um and i'm asking you all just to stay on the line so thank you very much maya thank you yan thank you mark uh, and i'm now going to introduce on the screen lou cooperhouse uh from blue nalu um uh, lou can you hear me i can david can you hear me i can hear you loud good god it looks like you've got a storm behind you uh, or is that just love, just very grey behind you? I'm not expecting that in California. This um, is San Diego. Well, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> cold outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lou, tell us a bit more about what you plan your plans for uh, Tudor and Blue Nalu. Over to Thank you. you. Thanks, and and it's a it's an honor to be on this program with Agronomics today. Uh, let me share my screen. We can see it, okay? Yep, absolutely. Go for it. So, so Bunalo was actually uh, formed back in early 2018, so about four and a half years old, and we're just uh, really proud to be on this panel today with Agronomics and so, so uh, excited by their support since our very beginning. Um, our, whole, our mission, frankly, is to globally lead this new category of cell cultured seafood, uh, really providing, as kind of Anthony mentioned earlier, products with unique benefits uh, that only this uh, technology can create. Uh, focus first on great tasting products, but those that are also healthy, humane, and sustainable at the same time. And as you mentioned, uh, David, our first product will be, in fact, bluefin tuna toro. We've done uh, quite a number of finfish species, which I'll talk more about, but we're very excited by this first product being quite the model for what this technology can create. Um, and, and as you can see, we're aligned with a number of the UN SDGs, and I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. So, my, my background is almost 40 years in the food industry, worked uh, in food innovation, technology, commercialization the entire time. Early on, Camels, Conagra, Nestle, been involved in startups as a co-founder since the 90s, actually, um, and also have run incubation programs and entrepreneurship development programs as well. 
And I just became just totally fascinated with the whole category of cell culturing when it was first kind of uh, announced uh, as proof of concept back uh, roughly 10 years ago, uh, 2013. Um, but really saw this as extremely disruptive to make an animal product without the animal, which as Anthony described is what this is all about. Uh, the exact same characteristics as that conventional product, but made in a new way. In the case of seafood, it's not wild, it's not farmed, it's made with cell culturing processes. Why did I select seafood? The category began with beef and poultry, but I was very motivated as a person for the food industry at the extraordinary opportunity and transformation that could occur specifically with seafood. Uh, fundamentally, there is a global supply chain gap. The demand for seafood is at all time high, uh, particularly in Asia where GDP uh, increases in the coming years will, will, will just really uh, exacerbate that demand. Right now it's three to five times per capita consumption of what it is here in the US or in Europe. So our challenge is as demand increases, as, uh, as consumers are shifting for red meat towards seafood for its health benefits, um, we are constrained by our supply. It's a highly variable, very insecure supply chain. It's the last hunted animal. Um, obviously warming oceans, climate change, acidification, algae blooms, all these global challenges, not to mention war um, and even disease could really uh, challenge our supply chain. Uh, furthermore, it's just very inefficient, you know, obviously causing considerable damage to our oceans. Um, and we need to maintain that healthy ocean ecosystem for our planet, frankly, to survive. So what we're doing is actually making these seafood products directly from fish cells that will actually have a number of benefits, which I'll describe in a moment. So said differently, you know, we really need to maintain this ocean ecosystem, as I've described. Um, as you can see on the left-hand column, obviously all the challenges in our ocean, which I mentioned, commercial fishing has certainly labor practices, high cost of production, shipping seafood, maybe 10,000 miles from Southeast Asia to say New York City with maybe 30% bycatch, maybe 50 or maybe 60% yield, just inefficient no matter how you look at it. Um, and at the human health level, we're dealing with products that do contain potentially mercury and plastics, toxins, pollutants, um, many challenges to our to our uh, uh, our own human health, and there's no shortage of information uh, constantly about, for example, uh, mercury or plastics that uh, actually plastics that has shown up uh, at, at credit card size um, in your body over the course of a year in your lung, uh, in mother's milk, uh, et cetera. Um, at the food service level, another challenge we have, as I mentioned, just variability that's so extraordinary. Cell culture seafood makes a 100% yielded product, um, and it really takes away the volatility and pricing and so forth that we're seeing today. So what we're really talking about here is for the first time, like vertical farming, creating a vertically integrated seafood ecosystem. So the opportunity to really transform this global supply chain is quite extraordinary, displacing this tremendous inefficient model that exists today where seafood may actually be caught in Alaska, go to China, come back to the Americas and be shipped to Europe, um, you know, in different forms along the way. So this vertically integrated model is where Bunalu is actually responsible in a demand driven situation, no longer a supply restricted one to actually create factories close to population centers. So truly quite a game changer. So as mentioned, we are based in San Diego, California. We have two operations today. Um, roughly, uh, I'm sitting in the second one where it's a little cloudy outside, um, but in, in the one location called Cornerstone, roughly 6,000 square feet, where we're doing our core R&D, creating stable cell lines from seafood species that have never been done before. This technology began with mammals because the science was pre-existing based on the, the work on humans and other mam mammalian creatures over the last couple of decades, but there was little to no technology that existed in the world of seafood. So we have literally propagated and created stable cell lines that have never been done before. Uh, we believe we might have more stable cell lines here in San Diego than exists anywhere in the world in aggregate. Um, so again, a very new technology, uh, really understanding uh, the, the mechanics, if you will, of various fin fish species, our initial focus. And on the right-hand side, this is an innovation center, roughly 40,000 square feet, just shy of that where we're doing uh, GMP pilot production, but also manufacturing product over the coming year that would be utilized for regulatory purposes as well. 
We are just initiating this facility. So uh, during our, we're certainly, as all of us today are talking about, we're in our scale up journey, um, but we're very excited by the next couple of years to actually have a number of products that will uh, be uh, commercially approved uh, through regulatory agencies uh, across the world. So our technology is quite differentiated. Um, and as I began this company, Blue Nalu was really focused on scale. As I mentioned, proof of concept happened back in 2013 with the first uh, uh, hamburger example. I was very motivated by seafood because of the many health benefits and other benefits that can be created. But this is, you know, we are not in the world of creating proof of concept, it's proof of commercialization, which is totally my background. And we really looked at this uh, opportunity about what does it take to scale? Um, how do we actually avoid some of the challenges that might lead to consumer adoption or regulatory approval? And how do we avoid some of the challenges that Mark Warner mentioned uh, that really deal with scaling, scale altogether? So what we have created at Bunalo is really quite differentiated in the world of seafood. We have non-GMO techniques uh, for myoblast cell lines. Uh, just a lot of, a lot of uh, techno speak here, but we have created a scalable suspension cell process for seafood that we believe is quite unique in the space, meaning we're not using some of the plant-based materials like microcarriers and scaffolds. We are doing a whole muscle product. We are not blending as some of our peers might be doing with plant-based ingredients in order to get the cost of goods down and also to order to enable uh, you know, some sort of uh, process development. But we are really taking a very high road here and creating a whole muscle product, non-GMO, uh, suspension cells, absence of scaffolds and microcarriers. And we've today worked on eight different finfish species. Our first one is bluefin tuna tor we're going commercially with. Um, but as you'll mention in a minute, we've actually identified a methodology that we believe can be quite profitable with gross margin that could be as high as 75% because of our focus on high value products, premium seafood, and generally speaking, a low cost of goods and a low capex. We have quite a bit of proprietary uh, technology, including animal component free media that we've created, and also lipid loading technology, which enables us to fat load muscle cells uh, to dramatically reduce our, our capex as well. So we've also identified uh, that our products are very, uh, uh, that we believe our products will have a great deal of motivation by consumers. So as I mentioned, uh, we've learned from food service operators that, could, that, that seafood can be quite unpredictable, quite volatile. Uh, they are looking for a consistent supply, no longer seasonal with 100% yield that takes out back of the house labor, takes out the volatility. There's a reason why it says market price on a menu at a restaurant because you just never know on any given day what the product might be or what its price point might be. Consumers have also told us they love seafood. Uh, why we ask them is because of the health benefits. Why don't you consume more? And they've actually said because of the health challenges. Uh, and we say, what do you mean? Say, we're increasingly aware of mercury and microplastics. So when we introduce Blue Nalo, they're very excited by the fact that our product will be absent of those ingredients. And again, create a more uh, a, a product that we believe will be quite superior. Here's actually some examples of prototypes that we developed at Blue Nalu. This is again our bluefin tuna toro in the form of a saku block that will enable great versatility for the food service operator, you know, sushi and fine dining, preparing either nigiri or sashimi uh, rolls. Uh, you can see just various applications here. So this is product that we've developed. This is our products, not a benchmark uh, conventional product that we're pretty excited by uh, how far we've come in the last several years. Again, we're still in the concept stage, but we are going through the regulatory and small scale market development stages over the coming years. A big differentiator for Blunalo is our strategic partnerships. Um, from the very beginning, uh, back to our ARAM, uh, which was back in 2019, uh, we've been able to attract a number of partners that have really validated what Blunalo is all about and that can really support us in supply chain operations, sales, marketing, distribution. Uh, they include in, in the United States, Griffith Foods and Rich Products, uh, in Europe, Nomad Foods and Utreco, and in Asia, uh, Food and Life, which is, uh, we believe, one of the largest users of bluefin tuna on the planet, um, and a thousand unit sushi restaurant chain, but also major seafood distributors uh, and processors that include Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, and Thai Union, and Pomoan based in South Korea, 
which is a major lifestyle a distribution manufacturing company as well. So again, we can't do this alone. So our, our support of our partners is really enabling us to get to the scale over the coming years. Just some headlines around that. Uh, obviously, the Treco, a wonderful supplier on supply chain, uh, one of the largest suppliers of agriculture feed on the planet, is really helping us to drive our costs down. And many others are really helping us understand the consumer, gain regulatory approval, uh, and ultimately help us distribute our products in the future. Kind of as we wrap up, just a couple of recent announcements. Uh, we're proud to have joined the uh, UN Global Compact uh, earlier this year. Uh, and on our website, you'll see a bluefin tuna deep dive, as we call it, a white paper. It's on the resources tab of our website that really explores why we chose bluefin tuna. And this really is, as you mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, the most uh, challenging sensory product. So this is Bunalo is all about. We are a culinary driven company working on the most complicated and exciting product of them all, the Wagyu beef of the sea, if you will, the bluefin tuna, and specifically the Toro portion, the high fat belly portion uh, that really resonates with uh, food service operators, but also with consumers uh, as something that is highly desired, but definitely not sustainable. We also announced just a few weeks ago uh, that we have really believe we've cracked the code to significant profitability Whereas this category is quite challenging from a cost of goods point of view, uh, we've identified that with our high value premium focus and the cost of goods and technology achievements that we've accomplished to date, that we believe we can literally have 75% gross margin in our first facility that we believe can create 6 million pounds of product, uh, generate uh, substantial revenue in the hundreds of millions in each factory. Again, that's just a small percentage of the global market share of Bluefin and even the broader category of seafood, but this is an extraordinary start and can really demonstrate uh, how this uh, whole, whole technology can be scaled quite rapidly in the coming years. So this is my contact information, our website's bluenal.com, and uh, real excited to take uh, questions uh, later on in the program. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lou. Um, that was excellent. The Wagyu of the ocean. Um, okay. Uh, Lou, we'll be coming back to you. It's quarter past, roughly quarter past four. Um, but next up, we have Hans Hustra of uh, Beatable. Can you hear me, Hans? Yes, I can, uh, David. Can you see me? I can see you and I can hear you. So, cool. over to you. Thank you. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, actually, there was a bit last minute because one of our founders, Grind the Note, was going to do this conversation unfortunately he was sick so my name is Hans Heistra I've been in the food and the dairy industry for quite some time now first part of my career I basically uh, was building and running factories Asia US Middle East and Europe uh, ending that part of my career being the global head of manufacturing and procurement at Friesland Campina uh, at the time. And the second part of my career, I spent in general management, both for B2B and B2C companies, um, running the B2C companies for Friesland Campina in Southeast Asia. After that, a while in the executive board of the Hero Group in Switzerland. And the last seven years, I've been to that company, which was mentioned quite a lot in the precision fermentation uh, presentation. So I was seven years president of Fonterra uh, for Europe, Africa, uh, Middle East, and Russia. Um, though I am a passionate believer in precision fermentation as well, that wasn't the reason that I left the industry. Yeah, I, I actually met the founders of the company uh, middle of 21, Grind the Note and Dan Leining, two really visionary entrepreneurs. Dan, the technical technological genius uh, who saw basically the technology from our third co-founder, co Mark Cotter from Cambridge and the founder of BitBio coming past his desk. And Dan was already involved with the University of Maastricht when the first uh, burger from Cultivated Meat was based. He was one of the big supporters from the start um, of it. Yes, I will start my presentation as well. I thought this part wasn't really 
covered by the presentation yet. Um, but I met him in Krein and really got convinced that basically this is the way forward. This is the forefront of food technology and this is what happens. David, can you see my presentation now? Yes, we can see that. Okay, excellent. So uh, Meetable, like agronomics, um, started up in 2018, uh, based in Delft in the Netherlands. It was founded in Leiden, moved to Delft, and will move back to Leiden next year. Uh, currently, we're approaching the 90 people in our team. It's a, a brilliant combination of, uh, of scientists, yeah, which have been leading the charge the first number of years, combined now with some very seasoned um, professionals across the different disciplines. We've had our Series A funding last year yeah, with the, the raise of 47 million, and we were very proud and happy to have agronomics come on board as, as one of our very important investors as well. And you see some of the others uh, on, this, uh, on this sheet there as well. So it is total funding now at 60 million and basically the company is moving strong. You see the name of DSM from the Netherlands as a strategic partner of us addressing the, the media and the media cost, which is one of the big cost drivers in our industry. And they've been a fantastic partner on that journey, basically bringing us forwards to the cost level where we want to be. When Anthony started the presentation earlier this afternoon, he showed the still increasing market size of meat, yeah, which is probably the global, globally the, the biggest, single biggest market in the world, which still needs to be really disrupted and brought basically there. Yeah? With the growth of meat consumption is something we believe is going to be here to stay. Our mission is to satisfy the world's appetite for meat without harming both people, animals, and planet. And it's our first product on which we focused, and that's based on the technology at hand, and I will get back to that in, uh, in, uh, in a minute from now, is pork, but the technology basically will also move to beef yeah, and is applicable for every single type of meat which is there. Our route to market is, is quite clear. So 22, we've had our first tastings of products yeah, and it is truly a big step up when you actually taste a product with cultivated meat in there, which was for me new also, but in comparison to plant-based meat, it, it really was a step up, which was considerable. We're basically heading, and we've announced uh, three weeks ago, our partnership with a CDMO in, um, in Singapore, Esco Aster, to basically start with our consistency batches and our tech transfer to Singapore uh, in 2023, yeah, where basically the plan is to file end of 23 for registration in Singapore and start at the same time also with the building of our first factory to go to market. 2024, we expect to have the registration in hand and move for a initially small scale launch to a number of restaurants yeah, while finalizing our first factory at scale, also in Singapore. Yeah, then it is basically that we will have proven that the technology does not only deliver a very good product, that there is the market acceptance, but also that we have proven that the process works at scale. And that is basically where the next steps will be. The most likely scenario, and I think Anthony referred to it already, is that the US will open up first. So that's also very much on our launch calendar, but we are following all the other markets very closely as well. And various of the big importing markets of pork, which are based in Asia, are very relevant to us. Um, but as well, basically, uh, maybe uh, countries like the UK, et cetera, like that, a bit close. 
The European side will be a bit slower because of the novel foods process, but we do expect also that given the environmental pressures within Europe, that also Europe will basically try to find ways to accelerate the process. Why we can realize these timelines is basically because with the, the choice of cells and the process associated with that, combined with the fact that our proprietary uh, Optiox technology uh, gives us basically the fastest process in the industry, yeah, it, it truly enables us to scale the process relatively straightforward. Yeah, it has also a huge effect on the capital efficiency and basically on the regulatory readiness for that as well. The, this slide more or less encompasses at a very high level the, the, the strengths of Meetable. It is because of the technology, and I'll, I'll dive into that a bit more in the, the slides which are after this, it has the potential for the lowest cost level in the industry. Um, it is basically the potential to scale it up to a large scale manufacturing site based on process stability. And it is also, and that's the, the step which in our process will be the next step to follow. We will start with basically the products which you would refer to as minced meat products, yeah, which is more or less the entire industry currently also covered by plant-based solutions. But it is also the credible path towards full cuts of meat, yeah, which basically would then need still the development of some specialized tissue reactors. Platform and the technology which is underlying Unmeetable and which enables us to, to be the fastest process in the industry is applicable to all species. Yeah, and that is also in our trajectory moving forward. And in the end, it is, I skipped this slide, I won't want to talk about it too much, but it is about the cell economics. So the, the proper cell choice so that you get the efficient conversion of nutrients and basically a process which is also fast, yeah, because that will enable basically the cost efficiency to actually make it work also in the competition against regular meat. Uh, a while ago, the CE Delft, the consulting company, has worked with a number of the, the companies within the industry to have an estimate on what the cost could end up to on, the, on cultivated meat. And we've basically put, on, based on their assumptions, we put next to it where meatable can end. And we still expect this to come down in time even further, especially when growth media cost starts to come down. And the big advantage of our choice, and it's a choice for pluripotent stem cells, and then a very fast differentiation process is that we can create the biomass needed um, relatively quick and in a continuous process. And then because our process of differentiation, and my apologies for the bit techy speak, but it is proliferation is where you increase the number of cells. And then differentiation is that you actually move the cells from a pluripotent stem cell phase towards basically both a muscle cell and a uh, fat cell. Yeah, and that process, because this so fast, it actually has a knock-on effect on all cost factors within the industry. This is the process how normally a, uh, and this is the, the, the picture is for the, the muscle cells. This is how the process would go if you go from pluripotent stem cells, which is widely recognize as the best uh, cell type to use, but it takes a long time and the efficiency doesn't stack up. Yeah, what the unique thing, and that is the proprietary uh, patent as well, which basically from BitBio has gotten transferred for the food industry to, um, to the, you know, from, from BitBio, from the medical to the food industry. And that actually, enhances the speed of the process tremendously. And it's clear, especially within eight days that you have this process taken care of. I'll speed up a bit. These are the differences versus myoblasts. 
a faster doubling time, doesn't require fetal bovine serum. Basically, pro it can proliferate indefinitely and it can turn into any cell type. So it is some of the benefits. Now let me conclude with the team. So I already referred to Krein, the notes, basically the, together with Dan, the two visionary founders of, uh, of Meetable, Mark Cutter, who brought in the technology. Very proud to have Case de Jong as our chairman, the former CEO of uh, Christian Hansen and CEO at uh, Crucel, so with knowledge both on food and in pharma. Yeah, and then in the management team next to me, Jeff, who's uh, very strong career in cell development, Ruth, who was with the company from the start, and then the two real engines in the management team with Caroline and Chris, who drive both our preparation for the com commercial launch uh, and basically Chris driving also the part through the, uh, the, the change and the execution on sites. Yeah, and then in the end, I will end up with the slide for which also the impact of the industry as a whole will have, but this is more or less with the savings and these are derived from the TA done by the CE Delft as well. Yeah, is by the time of 2035, huge savings on CO2, on water and on animal lives. And then I give it back to you, uh, David. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, that's excellent. Uh, okay, right, we'll be coming back a, a bit later to you when we do the panel in a quarter of an hour. Um, and just one quick thing, we have been asked on the chat, will this be made available later? Uh, is there a recording being made? And the answer is yes. So come back to the site and you'll be able to uh, go back to the agronomic site. I'm sure it'll be on there. Okay, um, hopefully we've got Ingvar coming. I Ingvar, are you there? I am indeed. Do you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? And I can hear you perfectly, and I can see you perfectly, Ingvar. Ingvar, Vitro Labs, um, do you want to take put, put up your presentation, see if it works? It's over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Agonomics and uh, David, for having me here. Uh, I'm super excited to be able to present uh, the latest updates from uh, Vitro Labs. Um, so my name is uh, Ingvar. I'm the co-founder and CEO. Um, Vitrolabs, we're in the alternative protein space, but in a slightly different field uh, than a lot of the um, agronomics portfolio companies. We are creating self-cultivated leather. Um, leather is a significant industry. It's a 400 plus billion dollar uh, industry that is uh, hugely fragmented as, uh, as it currently stands. All right, um, so the um, traditional leather supply chain, um, it is, um, it's, as I mentioned, hugely fragmented. Uh, a hide can travel up to uh, 19,000 miles before it actually gets uh, made into a uh, product. And uh, so it comes from farms all over the world, whether it's a, uh, depending on the price of the hides, it's either a byproduct or a co-product of, uh, of the meat industry. So um, when we look at this, um, of course, with, global uh, insecurities, supply chain disruptions, as we've seen over the last few years. It is uh, detrimental for brands to be able to secure their supply chain and make sure that they have the materials needed to make products. Um, our target market in the beginning is the luxury leather goods industry, and, uh, and they've seen huge disruptions over the last uh, few years in terms of just being able to procure enough hides to make their products that, of course, are the main revenue generators uh, for their products, which are the leather goods that you can see in stores uh, from brands like um, Chanel, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Hermes, etc. So what we propose doing here at Vitro Labs is really re-centralizing that supply chain, hyper-localization, being able to grow things where you use them, uh, where you need them in a timely manner and in a manner where you can scale demand up and down based on seasonal trends. So it's something that is not possible with current, <clears throat> current supply chains, because again, you have to plan usually two years in advance um, how uh, what hides you want to purchase from which farmers before they go through the growth process of, uh, of, of course, rearing the animal and then uh, shipping the hides across the world uh, for tanning and uh, finishing. So with our process, you can really 
dial this demand up and down within a few weeks rather than a few years. So the high level process, um, it's a one-time sourcing of uh, cells from an animal um, through a harmless biopsy, uh, no larger than my small fingernail here. We then uh, take those cells into our labs. We expand those cells in um, large volumes in, in bioreactor systems or stertang reactor systems, um, which are fairly similar to the fermentation systems that, uh, that some of the companies that uh, presented earlier are using. From that process though, we then harvest our cells. We uh, freeze them down into a working cell bank. And um, from there on, that's when our unique part of the process starts. So we then take the cells from our working cell bank. We thaw them, seed them onto uh, proprietary biomaterial scaffolds that we've developed internally. And um, in tissue reactors or tissue cultivators, we grow flat sheets of, uh, of calf hides. Um, that's a process that takes approximately four weeks. Um, throughout that process, it's a fully automated uh, feeding system. So again, kind of nothing has to be nothing uh, nothing has to be done from uh, our team when we're at scale. And uh, those hides after four weeks then get um, harvested, like you would do with a traditional um, well, traditional calf hide. But the main difference is, of course, it doesn't come from an animal. We then um, salt those hides, as also you would do with a traditional hide. We then ship them off to uh, our tanneries, uh, our partners' tanneries, uh, which are based in France. And then they go through the tanning process, um, which is crucial to the products because it's really where in the tanning process that the artistry and the, the unique capabilities and unique properties of the leather gets imbued into the material. Um, you can imagine a cowhide, it can become either a car seat, it can become a soft leather glove, it can become a handbag, a belt or a shoe, but it all comes from the same animal. So it's really that tanning, which is something that we still interface with, uh, which is uh, the key to a versatile material that the market and, uh, and our partners can use in their variety of products. The tanning, of course, as uh, there's always a question about tanning, it's not necessarily the best process, but uh, our partners have developed, first of all, a chromium-free recipe, which means that we remove heavy metals from the tanning process. And also because instead of having a full thickness calf hide where you need to remove keratins, hairs, et cetera, and excess fat and meat from the hide, um, which takes a lot of uh, very coarse chemicals, um, and it's it's a kind, kind of a very intensive uh, process. We only grow what is needed. It doesn't have any of these additional um, things that are uh, attached to the hide. So again, it's a shortened process. We tan only what is needed, which removes approximately 80% of the wastage that happens with traditional hides. Uh, much fewer chemicals are used in our process, less waste produced, and of course, as I had mentioned, chromium-free. The process, um, as I described it earlier, um, it's a straightforward process, it's patented, and uh, it's uh, highly scalable. Um, one of the things that we're quite happy about uh, at Vitro Labs is that we are working in a non, uh, in a completely unregulated industry. So again, as long as it's safe for the environment and safe for our employees, um, that's all the regulation that we need to adhere to. We don't have the FDA, we don't have the USDA or any other uh, regulatory bodies uh, looking over our shoulder. So it allows us really to uh, operate fast, iterate fast and scale fast. So the process goes through the expansion. Um, the uh, Some of our older photos here, uh, because of IP reasons, we can't show the latest ones of the latest cultivators and the latest uh, reactor systems that we have in place. Um, but on the first photo, um, that's the device that we use for the cell expansion. Um, on the second photo, we cultivate the hides. Um, you see in that, in that um, fridge looking unit, which is an incubator, uh, we're growing multiple sheets of uh, calf hides. The um, harvested hides, look um, like this on the third photo. Um, it's me holding one of the, it's actually one of the largest engineered tissues that have ever been made in the world, uh, which is quite exciting. Um, and uh, then we go into the tanning. So these uh, photos are from our partners um, in France, where they go through the tanning and the finishing uh, steps. And what we get at the end are hides that look like this. 
Um, so these uh, are our hides uh, from last year. We also haven't um, been able to show the photos of our latest hides, um, but these hides are then used to actually make products. Um, we are already in that phase with our partners. Um, talking about our partners, as uh, Anthony had mentioned in the beginning of this session, uh, we are super excited to uh, be able to announce uh, something that we announced earlier this year, but uh, super excited to be able to share here that we've invest, uh, we received investment and have a product partnership with the Caring Group. Um, the Caring Group is a French luxury conglomerate. Uh, they own brands such as Gucci, Bottega Veneta, Balenciaga, Yves Saint Laurent, Alexander McQueen, and others. Um, so this is um, it's a hugely exciting opportunity for us. Um, we are apparently the first company in um, this field that they have made a direct investment in. And so it's a huge validation of our platform and, of course, allows us to have these uh, this uh, product partnerships learning about how our heights should be tanned for the optimal um, for the optimal performance that the luxury industry requires. Um, the great thing about working with an industry like the luxury industry is the fact that their standards are extremely high. So anything that passes uh, passes the quality checks with them will pass quality checks in pretty much any other industry. So our leathers, the benefits of them, uh, we do not rely on animal agriculture, apart from that initial first uh, sample that we get from a cow, uh, which is a one-time process. We grow premium quality hides. They are compatible with existing supply chain infrastructure. Um, so again, the tanning and the finishing and our partners can use them like they use with uh, use traditional hides. So again, it is a uh, product that requires very little adaptation from their side, which of course saves them money in the setup and uh, allows their manufacturers to use same processes for our hides as traditional hides. Um, our process is also fully traceable. So again, the provenance of these hives is very well known. It's something that, of course, the luxury industry talks a lot about, whether it's Italian leathers or French leathers, and it's really part of their um, part of their messaging. Um, so that's something that uh, that we can, of course, show them. And then we produce them and tan them with a simplified and uh, much more environmentally friendly and sustainable process. So to of course, there has been a huge conversation about greenwashing, specifically in the fashion industry. Um, so we're proud to announce that we're actually working with Harvard University um, on the world's first ESO compliant life cycle analysis on uh, cultivated uh, hides. And this is where we're going to be comparing it to traditional hides. Um, it's a uh, we use this tool for strategic decision making when we are looking at building out our first full scale manufacturing facility. Um, so it really helps us inform how we can do best for the environment and for the planet. Um, and of course, while delivering the best products possible. Um, I have unfortunately had to remove the uh, the uh, the legends on the on the graph there, because again, we are in the process of getting it ESA certified. So, but after that, we're gonna be announcing what exactly those, um, those um, savings in terms of environmental impact uh, look like. The phase of the company. So we raised our Series A earlier this year. Uh, we have raised in total of uh, $46 million. Uh, Agronomics led this round, uh, which we are super happy about and super grateful to have their support. Uh, I don't think that there is any fund that has a deeper knowledge and, uh, and greater insight into whether that is cell-based technologies or fermentation-based technologies. So again, it's a, it's a huge uh, validation from our side to have them on board as our lead investors. Um, other amazing investors that joined Coastal Ventures, uh, we have also uh, Regeneration, uh, which is a new impact fund, and Heartland, which is the family office of uh, of uh, of uh, bestseller, uh, the owner of bestseller, which is a Danish uh, fast fashion group, and that also wants to make sure that these technologies exist in the market, so we can actually start moving to not just the luxury segment but to other segments as well um we have um, taken um we have uh, taken over our uh, 45,000 square foot r d and pilot facility and the most exciting thing here is that we have started pilot production two months ago and so we are now consistently delivering product to our partners and uh, are going to be scaling that up in uh, q1 and q2 of next year um, to get to uh, the capacity that our partners require from us at this early stage of development um, our team 
is really you know the 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 key to our success um I spend my life in the fashion industry. Um, this is something that I'm passionate about. I love materials and I love innovation and seeing how technology can interface with that. Um, we have a an incredible chief uh, product officer who spent eight years at Chanel as the uh, head of leather sourcing for small leather goods. Um, so he really knows his industry from a product perspective. And um, our um, chief operating officer has spent uh, her life in um, high growth software companies in the Bay Area. So really understands the operation efficiencies that can be implemented and our latest hire our um, CTO uh, Lance Kaiser who uh, was one of the first uh, employees at Ripple Foods which is a plant-based milk uh, company that is being sold uh, nationally here in the U.S. and uh, has consistently taken a new technology scaled it up and delivered a successful product to market so our team is really our uh, secret the secret to our success so um, with that Thank you so much. Uh, here is my email if anybody feels like emailing uh, and uh, wants to get in touch to learn more either about uh, the investment side or the product side. Uh, always happy to entertain a conversation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Ingvar. Uh, if I can ask back in uh, Hans and Lou, can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. Well, again, we've only got about 15 minutes and we've got lots of questions. So I'm kind of quick fire questions um try and get through as many of them as i can Ava, why don't we st start with you just because you were the last person talking so you get them um sure. are you specific to uh cow hides any variations on cow hides anything else in leather it's a great question so um we that's the product that we're starting with but we have crocodile cells we have ostrich cells we have sheep cells all in our labs so it's uh, these are products that we want to launch to market um but um, because um calf hides are the biggest um is the biggest market segment and uh, as actually Lou touched on earlier is the uh, most research has actually been done on mammalian cell lines so for us it's the it's the product that we can get to markets market the quickest um but crocodile cells is something that i'm super excited about but that's going to be a second or third product and how durable is the the leather you produce can you pull it apart do, you know, is it durable it's very durable um so we go through the same amount of tests as traditional hides um so with our product partners they you know post tanning they they take it through um i, mean, I think there's a body of 20 plus tests that they, that it runs through um they are in the process of validating our latest batches so um but in the past we have seen that we have um grown extremely durable hides and uh and something that we're excited to bring to market last quick question for you um Am I going to be seeing this in uh, a luxury motor car in time soon? I could just see a nice Bentley, for instance, with some nice leather seats in, uh, with some vitro seats in. Can I see that in the next couple of years? Um, whether it's going to be in the next couple of years or in the next five years, we're already in conversations with the, some of the top motor companies, and, and some of you uh, will definitely know those brands. Some of you might even be lucky enough to already own cars by these companies, uh, but uh, out of my price range still. But uh, but we are, uh, we're looking forward to uh, working with these companies and bringing that to market. Okay, Lou. Um, actually, sorry. No, actually, uh, actually, sorry. Sorry, one more question, Igbar, because then I can segue to Lou, actually. Do you need any regulatory approvals? So the only regulatory approvals that we have is uh, is um, so we are going through uh, um, it's uh, so customs classification um, okay. what is, what are our hides and then um, there are some countries where there is restriction on what you can call leather and what you can't call leather okay. but yeah. we're already in conversation with with uh, with those uh, regulatory bodies to make sure that what we are producing is classified as leather. Okay, great. Uh, so picking up on that uh, uh, that regulatory theme, Lou. Um, Regulatory approval. Um, is it taking a while? Um, what's happening with the FDA? What's happening to the, um, what, I can't remember what the, the name of the American Food Regulatory Agency is. Uh, how, how's, how are those, that twin attack, twin attack going? Uh, yeah, great question, David. Yeah, there's, uh, in America, there's actually two agencies. Uh, one, historically, for meat and poultry, which is the USDA, the U.S. Exactly. Department of Agriculture. Yeah. And one that uh, deals with produce and seafood and other categories. It's just everything but meat and poultry, which is the FDA. Yeah. Um, so so uh, what your your listeners might be familiar with that a few years back, the, uh, the, the two agencies got together um, and identified that USDA and FDA would jointly regulate subcultured meat and poultry. And the FDA 
uh, consistent with prior practices would solely regulate cell culture seafood given their expertise in the F and the D, the food and the drug. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think where you're going with the question was obviously, as we all know, Singapore has a methodology in place that enables approval uh, through their own novel foods regulation. And they recently uh, modified that quite significantly. Um, so it's a it's a it's an ongoing process uh, of of regulatory approval in Singapore, uh, same in America. So America uh, in the U.S. Uh, they began the conversations again almost four years ago. We've been in touch with FDA from the beginning, um, and uh, obviously no companies have been approved yet. But we think it is somewhat imminent. Imminent meeting in the next uh, 12, 18 months tops. I feel is is quite uh, realistic okay. um, because they are really. Uh, talking with companies in a consultative fashion. It's very different than EU, frankly, um, where uh, we've been talking with them quite regularly, in fact, monthly or quarterly uh, over the last several years in an iterative fashion, understanding their methodology, their expectations. They're dealing with food safety, they're dealing with nomenclature issues, and they're also dealing with uh, the responsibilities for public disclosure, uh, all of which uh, are, are political and non-political things to really get this product across the finish line. Okay. Um, just in terms of products, obviously you're starting with tuna, and I see the logic there. Um, ever thought about going down the value chain to other fish? Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, you go to an English or British fish and chip shop, you could barely get cod, fish, <laughs> cod, and chipsy. Well, actually, that's not true. You can get cod. But um, looking at other uh, kind of white fish, or, or, is, or, or is the price point still right there? Uh, you're absolutely right, David. So yeah, we're beginning with high value products and migrating over time to high volume products. Um, so so the high value products are, are if you will, non-catabolistic, non-competing products yeah. targeted on, on sushi and fine dining restaurants. So there's a series of products. Uh, we have not announced what the other ones are, but we have a whole portfolio of species that we are we will be developing over time that initially are high value. But clearly, as economies of scale, you know, work their way into this industry, true of every other industry before us, um, we will see our costs come down and that will enable us to maintain our margins, uh, but, but at the same time, migrate into more high volume mass market products. Uh, I'm not sure we'll get to fish and chips, but certainly other species along the way are, are quite realistic. Okay, fine. Um, Hans, um, yeah, it's a good question, this actually, for something. You, you, you're looking at pork initially. And pork is regarded as probably one of the cheaper meats. Why did you go after pork and not go after, I don't know, what if um, tuna is the wagyu of uh, the ocean, why didn't you go after the wagyu of the land? <laughs> that, the high value stuff first, because pork is quite cheap. Oh, it's an excellent question. And it is the two, two reasons to it. One is pork is, especially in Asia, and if you take Singapore, it is, it's a huge part of the meat consumption in Singapore. Yeah is actually pork. So that's one of the reasons from a market side. Second is the technology that makes a meatable so unique, uh, that Optiox technology was developed for uh, the human, the medical side on things. And uh, the, the pork pigs are still closest to human when it comes to cell biology. So it's a combination of those two factors. Um, we have, and the team has already prepared uh, that the Optiox also works in cow, cow meat. So that, that is basically a cell line which is being developed and is going to be following pretty, uh, pretty soon after that. But the biggest impact on the environment is actually those two. It's especially pork meat and cow meat which have the biggest impact. So also from a mission and what we want to achieve, those two are the first ones on our list to do. But as I mentioned before, the technology is actually applicable along all species, even into leather and those kind of uh, products. Now, Hans, uh, in the paper, I think it was yesterday here in the paper, is in the UK, there was a frankly dreadful photo of, uh, of a pork building, yeah, of an enormous multi-story building in China where they, they pack in pigs, yeah. Uh, and um, it looked like an enormous car park, except, of course, it wasn't for the cars. Uh, and, of course, the logic was reduced cost and, and actually probably greater control over inputs. Um, so they could probably manage it, but they don't, they don't use as much land. But the point there, of course, is, is that, it, is that it, it, how do you get to cost parity when you're up against 
kind of that kind of industrialized process? I think it will be on both sides. It, it, this industry is going through a very uh, sharp development curve, basically bringing cost down. In the end, this is still, and even Winston Churchill, I believe, already said it, it doesn't make sense to grow an entire animal to only eat certain parts of it. So you actually will get to a much more efficient system on the long run if you basically go to cultivated meat. And that is true for fish, that is true for leather, that is true for meat as a whole. It, the, see, when you take, we, we have not moved into chicken and we've not done work on that. That is truly what you describe. Yeah, that's very much the case for, uh, for chicken. Unfortunately, also for pork. Yeah, and again, I come from a family, long-standing family of farmers. So I'm actually, I, I'm, my heart is still very close to them, but the, the bio industry and pictures like you refer to is not what we can have for the long run, uh, basically to feed our planet. So the, it's clear it, the, the challenges are, are still there, but it, this is truly the forefront of food technology and this will address and we will get to cost parity compared to more or less every type of meat. Two, you, you mentioned challenges. Let's, uh, let me just talk on two challenges. Uh, one is, uh, there's quite a few surveys being done and quite a lot of consumers, uh, when they talk about whatever language we're using today, cultivated meat, whatever the language is, cultured meat, surveys do come back and people go, lab meat, yuck. Yeah, there, there is a kind of, there is a kind of, and I'll be interested to see your view on this as well, Lou. There is a kind of, there's a residual worry, worry out there that surveys do pick up. And then the second argument, which you hear from more engineering related folk or scientific folk is uh, at the counter, which is a magazine that was in the space, uh, ran a big, long expose, which you guys will all know about, saying that it was just not a scalable industry. Yeah, you just can't scale it. You know, the, the, the media is not there. The bioreactor is there. It's just it's never going to scale. So actually, we don't have to worry about it. Don't, people don't have to worry about it being yuck because it will never get to scale. Um, Hans, how do you sort of go back and get, actually, I hear all three of you's view on it. How, Hans, how do you push back on those two, the yuck factor, the scale factor? Well, let me start with the second. So I was luckily that I could still read the counter article before I entered the industry. And it's right. a fantastic one. And it shows well the challenges. And I mean, I've talked to the team there as well. And it's actually been an inspiration to the industry because those things can be resolved. Yeah, it is It is great to have challenges like that post. And it, it shows also that, that it should not be uh, underestimated. But yep. I mean, those challenges can be tackled. I think the, the yuck factor, uh, it might be for old guys like us, David. Yeah, I think <laughs> the younger generation, you're underestimating. It is why we at Meetable say it's the new natural. Yeah, I've started my career at Unilever, I've seen the inside of slaughterhouses. Yeah. Really, I mean, it is a much better way to make meat in a bioreactor and in a tissue reactor than basically to lead those animals into slaughterhouses. So it's truly the new natural. That's why and that slogan was there well before I started, but it is it is the way to move forward. And I I, I don't underestimate the marketing challenges we all still have when we launch the product, but I think within the industry, and it was mentioned in the precision fermentation as well, we need a, a number of very strong companies who will drive this message all together, yeah, who will bring qualitatively very good product to the market, and then I'm 100% sure that it will succeed. Lou, what's your take on it? I mean, you've got, you don't really have to scale to fish and chip level for instance yeah <laughs> you could scale to you know be, but, but you still have to scale um and you're still going to get product well, how do you come back against that scale challenge at the counter rose yeah i uh, just to uh, follow up with hans uh, i too have been a slaughterhouse so that was my inspiration um to to really find a new a new way uh but to answer your question on scale that's why i acknowledge that recent press release we did that you know scale is clearly attainable um, and margin is very attainable, obviously picking species and really identifying, you know, you know, scalable processes. 
Uh, so, so yeah, the counter article, you know, you know, was correct in identifying what technologies are required to to enable scale. But as you can see, you know, we we are all accomplishing it in different ways. Um, but in your in your second question on consumers, uh, we've already demonstrated without product, but you know, secondary and primary research without product, uh, that uh, consumers are excited by cell culture seafood because again, it addresses. Uh, they love seafood, but they don't love seafood, you know, because of health. Uh, yeah, so we ask them that those that are most likely that consume seafood most frequently are most likely to want our products because it addresses the only concerns they have is the human health. Food service operators are similarly inclined because we're addressing, you know, their challenges, which is a predictable, consistent supply. And so again, that's the beauty of what we're all doing is we're we're solving an existing problem. Sustainability, animal suffering are also problems that are being solved, but we're hitting people in their pockets and in their health, which is uh, can be a big driver. I just want to ask one last question to all of you as well. We keep hearing Singapore get mentioned. Um, Singapore seems to obviously be pushing ahead reg in regulatory terms. Are there any other countries that are keeping up with the uh, Singaporeans? I, I could start. Yeah, uh, we're seeing activity uh, throughout Asia. And I think Singapore, you know, their driver obviously is food security. So we're, there's a lot of activity in Japan, a lot of activity uh, that's beginning in South Korea. You know, Anthony mentioned China has also put this on the horizon. Um, certainly other nations in Asia are also uh, beginning their early processes. So it's very motivating actually. And certainly in the Middle East, food security is a huge issue there as well. There's a lot of activity and also uh, even funding coming from that region of the world. Uh, and certainly uh, you mentioned uh, EU, but also the non-EU nations are also uh, looking for perhaps more accelerated pathways. So uh, it is very motivating around the world. Food security, frankly, is a driver, um, along with climate change and other factors that that's really enabling uh, the regulatory climate to move faster than otherwise. Okay, I I'm aware of time because we want to finish at uh, uh, four thirty. Um, I'm going to say thank you very much, Dinkar. Thank you to Lou. Thank you, Hans. Uh, and I'm going to hand back now to Anthony just to close the show. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks, David. And thanks, everyone, uh, for presenting. Look, I think the one thing uh, amongst many that I'm going to take away from today, uh, which uh, is obviously apparent to me, but perhaps less so to some of our uh, uh, viewers, is the experience level of the entrepreneurs that we have running the companies that are making such rapid progress. So thanks again for attending. Uh, the, the recording is going to be available afterwards, but it will take a couple of days to get it up. Um, look forward to speaking to you all soon. Thank you.